Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you. I'm really happy to see you at least virtually. But in the end, everything we have today. So um, I really enjoyed the workshop so far. And I want to, want to start with a very big thank you to Sarah and Adi. You really did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, organizing all the technical things in the background and everything else. Um, we had a wonderful day yesterday with brilliant talks and a really fruitful discussion I really enjoyed. And today we move on with this. I hope it will be uh, exactly success successful like yesterday. Um, but we move from manuscripts and manuscript production to material culture, more my kind of stuff. Uh, and I have the pleasure to share the first session. Um, as in every session, each speaker has 30 minutes. And at the end of this session, we will have another 30 minutes for discussion. For the lecture, I kindly ask you to mute yourself, but I guess all, everyone did already. Um, and please, like yesterday, submit questions before the discussion through the chat box. And I'm really happy to be able to introduce our first speaker today, Mera Schnitzer. Um, not only, but also because I was lucky to meet her two years ago, not really two years, one and a half year ago, in Leeds um, at the EMC, uh, where we had an intense discussion on objects in the Colmar treasure. And I think I instantly invited her to come to Erfurt, uh, where she stayed for studying the Erfurt treasure two weeks in February last year in real life. Good old days. Um, I hope we can we can uh, do this again some years later. Um, Merav is an historian. She's mainly researching uh, Jewish women's adornment and Jewish women in medieval society. Um, she's a research fellow at the Goldstein Gorin Diaspora Research Center in Tel Aviv University, the organizer of this workshop. She published a book on Jewish women in medieval society with the title Rape Between Halakha and Reality, Attitudes Towards Sexual Coercion of Women in the Medieval Jewish Communities of Modern France and Germany, um, printed in Tel Aviv University Press in 2017, and articles on Jewish women's adornment. Her title today, and I was very, very afraid uh, of pronouncing it, is Jewish Jeweler and Jewish Jewel, question mark, tracing a Jewish craft in the Middle Ages. And I'm looking forward to your talk, Merav. Please take the screen. Thank you very much, Maria, for this introduction. And thank you for, uh, for all the people that uh, organized this uh, uh, wonderful conference and session. I will share screen now. Um, Okay. Okay. So, um, Jewish jeweler, Jewish Jew, tracing Jewish craft in the Middle Ages. This is a question. Does a Jewish jeweler make Jewish jewels? I first asked this question when I came across an interesting halachic term, a jewel for Shabbat, Tachshit le Shabbat, meaning an object turned into a jewel to be used on Shabbat. These jewels made it possible for Jews to avoid the halachic prohibition on moving objects from the private to public sphere on Shabbat, the halachic rule that forbade Tiltul. The term jewel for Shabbat was first mentioned in 12th century in Northern France and the Holy Roman Empire. The jewel's material and design and the proper way to wear it were widely discussed by rabbis of the era. But surprisingly, I didn't yet find any discussion on craftsmen's identity nor their religion. Were the craftsmen necessarily Jews? In searching for this answer, 
I discovered a fascinating halachic discussion on the role of Jewish jeweler. It appeared that Jewish jewelers were not identified simply as craftsmen. They had important halachic role in the Jewish community. This role first mentioned in the Mishnah, second century AD, and the Talmud around fifth century AD. This discussion I discovered continued in the Middle Ages, revealing a new aspect of Jewish life in the medieval city. The first to change the Talmudic perspective on the role of Jewish jeweler were the Tosafists, Balea Tosafot, rabbis who lived in Northern France and the Holy Roman Empire in the 12th and 13th centuries. This change was described in their commentary on the Babylonian Talmud, Tracta Vodazara 53a. But first, let me examine the Talmudic discussion. In the Talmud, the sages debated the question whether Jews may change the purpose of non-Jewish worship objects, Bitul Avodazara. Most of the sages agreed that a Jewish jeweler, and the Hebrew term is Tzoref Israel, may. Jewish jewelers played an important role in economic, in economic connections between the Jewish and the non-Jews communities pagans during the Mishnaic era, and Christians at the end of Talmudic era. We have to notice that in these discussions concern precious metal, mostly gold and silver, usually both from Christian jewelers. Rabbi discussed three main options to change the worship object. The first, was melting the object. The second was changing slightly its shape by damaging, by damaging it, it's in Hebrew it's habala. By breaking a small piece of a cross, for instance, Jula changed its shape and definition. The third option was buying it. This option related mainly the fact that Jula could be also pound broker and became owner of pounds. As noted, the first to change the, this role were French Tosafists in the 12th century. They claimed that every Jew can buy from a Christian any object, even worship objects. And this is the, uh, what they claim. Yes, this is from the, their commentary. Israel legabe avodat kochavim ketzorfim. The term Jewish jeweler does not necessarily mean a professional jeweler, but even one who is not a jeweler at all. For in relation to pagan worship, all Jews are to be considered jewelers. Starting in northern France and then spread to the Holy Roman Empire, the unique halachic role of the Jewish jeweler gone. As a result, as noted, all members of Jewish community could buy and sell. Jews could buy now directly from Christian jeweler anything they would like. The only buying criteria that concerned the Jewish buyer were aesthetic, is it beautiful, and the price. Jews bought jewelry and other ritual objects decorated with crosses or with St. Mary on. In that manner, earrings decorated with a cross became simply beautiful jewelry when worn by Jewish women. Professor Joseph Schatzpiller related this aspect. Using crosses as ornaments raised this question. All crosses are ritual objects? Jews are asking these questions. I, I will quote Rav Yar's answer to this question. Rav Yar, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yoel Alevi, who lived in the Holy Roman Empire during the 12th and 13th centuries. And this is what Rav Yar is 
עצם. מה שתולין שתי וערב בצווארן לזיכרון שבאו מטעותן, לא מחמירן, מחמירנן באו. He claimed the cross, שתי וערב, they hang on the next, which they put just for remembering the mistake. We shouldn't be too strict on them. Meaning that the cross hang on the neck chain is not defined as Christian worship object. Jews can buy it and even wear it as a decorated item. Rav Yah's answer is also demonstrating the way this change spread in the Holy Roman Empire. But this was not the case in Spain. There, most of the rabbis, specifically the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, lived in the 13th century, denounced the changing of a lachic role of the Jewish jewelers. They continued to claim that the only one to be trusted to buy ritual objects from non-Jewish was a Jewish jeweler. Here I would like to add that it is most interesting to notice that rabbis in Spain were not willing to allow this kind of economic and cultural integration. What motivated the French rabbi to change the role of the Jewish jeweler? It seems that the economic needs of Jewish communities in Northern France had led the Tosafist, Balea Tosafot, to change rules in the 12th century. Northern France, France especially, the Ile de France and Champagne, became a center of markets and, and fairs. Jews became integrated in Christian economy in cities situated on main commercial routes and centers. These commercial routes were also developed in the Holy Roman Empire. You can see here the routes. It's, uh, although this map is from the 13th century, it started at the beginning of the 12th century. And this is the main routes. And you can see that the Jewish communities are here, center here, and here. Although Jewish jewelers lost their special role within the Jewish community in Northern France and the Holy Roman Empire, yeah, they were still part of the economy integration of Jewish craftsmen in the city. It is not clear yet how many Jewish jewelers became part of Christian guild in these areas. Professor Michael Tuch learned these aspects, but can trace another economy integration in Maharam of Rutenberg's responsa in the 13th century. Maharam forbade Jewish jeweler to serve Christian customer on Jewish holidays, Moadim, even the risk that Christian customers might leave the Jewish jeweler didn't change the Maharam rule. It was clear from Haram's ruling, however, that Jewish jewelers had Christian customers and that they served them even on Jewish holidays. It, it is also clear that Jewish jeweler competed the Christian jeweler. In these circumstances, the question I asked at the beginning of this paper, does Jewish jeweler make Jewish Jew seems now less relevant. To summarize, the role of Jewish jewelers had changed in 12th century in Northern France and the Holy Roman Empire when rabbis allowed other members of the community to buy Christian Celtic jewelry and other worship objects directly from Christians. I assume that new needs to integrate the Christian society both culturally and economically during that era motivated the rabbis to change the halachic role of Jewish jeweler. Where this also 
to changing of aesthetic preference. It can be just the wish to be fashionable. So this is, uh, this is my uh, paper now. And um, if uh, you, um, I, I assume that if you have a question, if questions, you can ask now, or is it at the end? I... Raf, normally, uh, normally you would, would switch now to Saskia. But if you need to leave earlier, we can also open the discussion now for 10 minutes no, no. or something. Uh, okay. okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So, thank you so much, Meraf. I'm, uh, I was waiting for seeing a Jewish jewel, but uh, I've seen a lot. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And I think we move on because we are so good in time. Um, we move on to the next uh, talk. We move on to Saskia Dönitz as far as we can. Um, Saskia Dönitz is our second speaker today. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Seminar for Jewish Studies at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And her research project is entitled Shemaria Ha Ikriti and the Intellectual Cosmos of the Byzantine Jews in the 14th Century. In 2013, she published her book Überlieferung und Rezeption um, des Sefer Josipon um, at More Sebag Publishers. And her title today is Silversmith and Silk Dyer, so we stay with the, with the precious metal, Silversmith and Silk Dyer, Byzantine uh, Jewish craftsmanship. And I would like to uh, yeah, change now for Saskia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Simcha Goldin. Thank you, Maria Stürzebecher and Andreas Lehmert for inviting me. I'm just joining in the praise of this workshop. I already learned a lot yesterday and I'm very happy to be part of this adventure. Um, as you already heard, my um, actual projects concerns much more the character and mindset of a Byzantine Jewish author of the 14th century, which is Shmaya Haikriti and his works. And I'm going, I hope that I'm going to be able to finish the book uh, and then during this year, if not Corona is going to make things much more difficult as they already are. But let's hope for the best. However, the Byzantine Jews and their role in the master narrative of medieval Jewish history and medieval Jewish cultures present the, present the larger framework of my research interest. It is in this comparative perspective that Byzantine Jewish history provides a counter narrative to the classical dichotomy that Jews under Islam lived in relatively peaceful convivencia with their Muslim neighbors while the Jews in the Christian countries were suffering from numerous pogroms and persecutions. Of course, research of the past 20 years modified this view sub substantively, including publications of various scholars. Some of them are present here, Ivan Marcus, Israel Yuval, Elisheva Baumgarten, Ephraim Schocham Steiner, and several others. They have shown how the Jews living in Christian lands participated in the culture of the majority society, adapting, adopting, and also countering elements and concepts into the Jewish Ashkenazic mindset. This workshop also contributes to these impressions of Ashkenazic day-to-day -day life, um, as we are going to see, I think. We much more were involved in Svarat yesterday. With this in mind, let me turn your attention to the Byzantine Jews. Judging from what the extant sources tell us, Byzantine Jewry was never subject to persecution and massacre to the same extent as the, as the Ashkenazic Jews, especially when looking at the 10th to the 15th century. During these centuries, there's close to no evidence to pogroms and persecutions of the Byzantine Jews. Some took place in the preceding centuries, 
Yet, there's, yet there was only a small number of them compared to Central Europe and, and the, the actual enforcement of the Byzantine forced conversions was called into question by several scholars. I'm referring to the forced conversions enacted in Byzantium under the emperors Heraclius in the 7th, Basilius in the 8th, 9th, and Romanos Lecapenos in the 10th century. But after the 10th century, events of this kind have not been recorded. There certainly were conflicts and polemics in the mutual view of Jews and the Christian Orthodox majority. And there also certainly was enmity from the side of the Orthodox Church. However, since the 10th century, no nationwide expulsion or forced conversion, no waves of pogroms follow, following false accusations like ritual murder or poisoning the wells took place in Byzantium. Despite religious polemics, the Jewish Christian relations lack the de demonizing language as well as the violent eruptions that prevailed in Central and Western Europe. This result of the survey of Byzantine Jewry, Byzantine Jewish history is remarkable, taking into account that Byzantium as Ashkenaz and also Svarat after the Reconquista was ruled by Christian authorities. Thus the traditional view according to which the Jews in the Islamic countries had much better possibilities to integrate and merge into the society of their environment while Jews in Christian lands were doomed to remain outsiders is blurred by the fact that in Byzantium, a Christian ruled empire, that in Byzantium, which is a Christian ruled empire, Jews did not live under the same threat of recurrent persecution as their brethren in Speyer, Worms or Mainz. On this background and in the framework of this workshop, I will now present a short overview on the subject of economic history and the role of the Jewish craftsmen in Byzantium. Jewish economic history of the Mediterranean was subject to research by Shlomo Goitain, and especially in relation to Byzantine economic history from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who actually should be giving this lecture since most of what I'm about to say is based on his numerous publications. The extant sources provide a number of occupational areas in which Jews have been making a living in Byzantium. Apart from, from performing functions in the service of the community, Jews were involved in trade, agriculture, and in crafts. Already in late antiquity, there is epigraphical evidence for a variety of professions with regard to crafts, such as cobblers, perfumers, goldsmiths, carpet weavers, purple dyers, and silk workers in Asia Minor and in the Balkans. From the early Middle Ages onward, Byzantine silk industry played a prominent role. role. Thus, primary, primary fields of Byzantine Jewish craftspeople and craftsmanship are the textile industry, especially is the textile industry, especially silk, tannery, and, and dyes. The production, of raw, uh, the production of raw silk, silk yarn, and silk fabrics began in Byzantium when Justinian I initiated the smuggling of silk work eggs from China to Constantinople around the year 550. The textile industry became a central element of Byzantine economy for imp imperial purposes as well as for export. Centers of silk production were established in Constantinople, Thebes, and in Corinth. Until the 12th century, Byzantium held the monopoly on silk in Europe. Byzantium was a leading center of silk industry, but was later replaced by Sicily, and also by Lucca and Venice. After, in 1147, Roger, Roger II of Sicily attacked the cities of Corinth and Thebes and carried off the silk workers and their equipment in order to establish silk facilities in Palermo and in Calabria. The importance of Byzantine silk as medieval items of luxury is demonstrated by the fact 
that silk fabrics were powerful political elements serving as gifts of diplomacy. Charlemagne received a shroud made of Byzantine silk as a precious burial gift, as you can see here. The role of the Jews in this type of textile production is illuminated in a number of sources. Already in the seventh century, in the context of Heraclius' forced conversion, called Doctrina Jacobi Nupa Baptizati, mentions <coughs> that the protagonist, Jacob, a converted Jew, was part of an illicit deal which involved the export of precious and expensive fabric, probably silk. A similar role of Jews as middlemen in the illegal trading of silk and silk products from Constantinople can be derived from regulations in the book of the Eparch. This book consists of a collection of Byzantine regulations concerning trade and professional guilds compiled in the 10th century. And the book states that the, pro and the, book states the prohibition of selling raw silk or cocoons of silk to Jews or to other merchants in order to prevent the selling of these goods outside the city of Constantinople. Obviously, Jews played, a, played the role of local middlemen in this illicit export of silk from the capital. So there's quite a criminal potential in all that field. Another source is a chrysobol issued by the co-emperors Basil II and Constantine VIII in 992, which completes this picture of Jews being part of an international trading network of silk commodities. The chrysobol explicitly also forbids that Venetian ships sailing from Constantinople should carry other passengers than citizens of Venice. Jews are listed among the forbidden groups, together with Amalfitans and Lombards. Thus, the Byzantine emperors were eager to ensure that resources like raw silk and cocoons of the silkworm stayed in the empire and were not shipped off to other regions in order to keep the monopoly. The role of the Jews, according to our sources, seems to encompass production of silk, as well as the forbidding selling of this precious textile. The involvement of Jews in the actual production of silk is mentioned by Benjamin of Tudela, the famous Spanish traveler who, in his travelogue, recorded every Jewish community he visited during his journey from Tudela to the Middle East around 1160 to 1171. When he came to Constantinople, he did not only refer to the Jews there, but before that, and against his usual routine, he described the riches and the luxuries of the Byzantine capital. The wealthy inhabitants woven and embroidered designs with gold, probably similar to the one that we saw uh, by, uh, that was given to Charlemagne. In his dis dis depiction of the Jewish community in Constantinople, Benjamin refers to Jewish artisans of silk, Omanim Shalmeshi, who probably were involved in the production of these very, these very vestments. Unfortunately, from Benjamin's description, it is not clear which part of the silk productions the Jewish artisans are involved in exactly. Benjamin's notes on Thebes, however, emphasize that the Jewish silk artisans as well as dyers of purple have to be accounted for being among the best in the country. From other sources on silk production, we know that there are several crafts necessary in order to produce silk garments and tapestries. The cocoons of the silk worms need to be degummed, spinned, dyed, and woven. Benjamin's remarks indicate that the Jews were involved in the craft of silk, malachat hameshi, and that they accepted fashion. 
over kitchen dining mentioning acted from participated comments sorry we have problems to hear you um just, just the last just the last two minutes it was not the whole time but you froze a few times yes you froze something like I that froze a few times okay let me see if i can do anything okay i'm, I'm just gonna start from the from the passage again Perfect. From other sources on silk production, we know that there are several crafts necessary in order to produce silk garments and tapestries. The cocoons of the silkworms need to be degummed, spinned, dyed, and woven. Benjamin's remarks indicate that the Jews were involved in the craft, craft of silk, whatever that means, malachat hameshi, and then the end that they excelled in that profession. Moreover, he adds that they also engage in dyeing the silk products with this very special element of purple, argaman. This explicit mentioning of purple extracted from the Murex mollusk implies that the Jews participated in the production of purple garments that actually, actually were reserved for the imperial court. Both of Benjamin's descriptions of Jewish artists and silk production in Constantinople, as well as in Thebes, suggests that Jews were an inherent professional group in one of the most representative branch of Byzantine textile industry, which of course contributed to their social status, as well as to their income. Still, the concrete manner of their pursuing this profession is unclear. Further evidence is given by the Karaite Bible commentaries. Jews were acting as weavers of silk garments that are mentioned in Bible commentaries written by the Byzantine Karaites in the 11th and 12th century. Jacob ben Reuven discussed the prohibition of wearing sha'adnes, the hybrid cloth, combining animal and vegetable material in his Sefer HaOshir. Since Byzantine silk cloth often consisted of a mix of silk with cotton or linen, the subject was highly relevant to Jewish craftsmen in Byzantium. However, his um, uh, Judah Hadassi, a Byzantine Karaite of the middle of the 12th century, the famous author of Eshkola Koffer, ruled that it was forbidden to wear these garments of mixed fabrics. Yet it was permitted to weave, buy, and sell them in order to make a living. So we can see here that Judah Hadassi obviously re was referring to his Byzantine fellows who were involved in, in weaving, buying, and selling silk, and especially silk as, as, in this manner of mixed fabrics. His predecessor, Jacob, uh, Jacob Ben Reuven, also mentions Jewish embroiderers executing Christian motives, obviously on silk clo cloaks intended for liturgical use. Moreover, J Jacob Ben Reuven's commentary attests to a high level of technical knowledge among the Jews of Constantinople. Employing a wide range of Greek technical terms, Jacob shows familiarity with the high standard of technology in the Byzantine Empire. This pertains to silk production as well as to techniques of goldsmithing. Unfortunately, we don't have any other evidence of goldsmithing in Byzantium. And now for something completely different. Another field of profession, which Byzantine Jews have been pursuing and compassed, tannery. Tannery, in contrast to silk production, rather belongs to the category of low profile professions, especially because of its foul and smelling waste products. Thus, tanning and dyeing were used as metaphors for Jews and the Jewish faith by many Christian authors 
for example, by Greg the by the Byzantine Gregorius Aspestas, the Archbishop of Syracuse in Sicily in his polemical treatise composed around 878 or 879. Also, Maximus Plomudis, a famous Christian scholar of the, in, of the 13th century, to whom we own the second mentioning of a synagogue in Constantinople, in the region of Langa, polemicizes against the Jews, causing stench and filth because of their professions as, as tenors and dyers. In the 14th century, several records inform us about the conflict between the Byzantine emperor and Andronicus II and the Venetian doge Johannes Superantio on the role of Venetian Jewish tenors who, who resided in Constantinople, but did not abide by the rules and prepared furred skins as well as hides. Other centers of Jewish tanning can be found in Crete, in Negroponte, and in Rhodes. Usually if you have a tanner, if you are pursuing the profession of tannery, you, you need a place where to put all the waste water so the tanners and the ten Jewish tanneries were usually close to a harbor. <clears throat> so the quotation I just showed by Maximus Plonudis is referring to the part of Vlanga. This is the part of Constantinople, which is more or less here, and it's close to the Contascalion harbor. I'm not sure if I can enlarge the picture here. No. Well, it's here. And if we turn now to, to Crete, to Candia, we even have a whole bay, a whole area close to the old city of Candia on, on uh, Crete, which is called the Bay of Dermata, the Bay of Hides. So in Candia, the tanneries were situated outside the city along this bay, the Bay of Dermata. Also the Takanot of Candia issued in 1228 confirmed the existence of Jewish tanners in that city. Thus tannery is attested to in many places in Byzantium and throughout the centuries. Furthermore, sources refer to other crafts like Jewish cobblers active in Candia around 1400. In 1420, a Jewish stonemason with his Christian partner built a cistern for a Jewish physician in that city. Jews as blacksmiths are mentioned in Chios and in Candia before 1424. A much earlier source, a letter sent from Constantinople at the end of the 11th century probably refers to a Jewish silver <laughs> Again, 500 years earlier than that, in the time of Theodosius II, a synagogue was mentioned at the copper market, the Chalkopatia in Constantinople. This leads to the assumption that Jews living in that area probably belong to this group of craftspeople too. All these records dem demonstrate that the occupational fields of Jews in Byzantium to a large extent consisted of crafts, similar to the Muslim countries we heard about yesterday. The number of Jewish workers in these fields in Byzantium seems to be rather significant. In Central Europe, however, the workers in crafts made only a small number of the Jewish population due to the hostility of the powerful craft guilds. The question arises how the Byzantine Jewish craftspeople were related to the Christian guilds. The above mentioned book of the Eparchs attested to the existence of guilds in Byzantium at least since the 10th century. Yet the book does not mention Jews as guild members, most probably they were barred from entering the guilds. Thus, why is it that Byzantine Jewish craftspeople nevertheless were pursuing the activities in such a significant number? It was suggested that the Jews were enrolled in a Jewish guild instead. 
Zvi Ankori promoted his view with, with his interpretation of Benjamin of Tudela's description of the Jewish communities in Constantinople and Thebes, stating that actually Benjamin was only talking about the silk workers in the Jewish guild and did not refer to any other group of Jews in Constantinople. This interpretation may be helpful in order to solve the problem of the numbers mentioned by Benjamin, he usually mentions the numbers of uh, Jews that he finds in each community he visits. On the other hand, it seems rather unlikely that the Byzantine church as well as the imperial administration would have allowed such an organization. And it is never mentioned in the sources. But I guess we will return to that question in the discussion. The Jewish silk traders and workers obviously were involved in silk production without being members of the Christian guilds and without belonging to a Jewish guild either. The closer look to the organization of the craftsmen's workshops was taken by ja David Jacobi David Jacobi in an article discussing Jews and the silk industry in Constantinople. His careful reading of the sources reveals that Christian guild members hired additional workers for their workshops, such as weavers, dyers, and tailors, who of course were not registered in the guild, meaning that they could have been Jewish too. So obviously Jewish, craft, Jewish craftsmen were independent workers, getting a salary according to peace which is also suggested in a letter from the Cairo Geniza. This is a letter, a business letter. So somebody wrote that actually he is dealing with uh, to the tanning of hides. And he's um, writing up probably to one of his business colleagues. And from the, most of the text, this is only a part of the letter, but for most of the text, it's, it's um, one can derive the, the notion that usually these workers are work, were working alone. We even don't have a real um, evidence for a Jewish workshop. Unfortunately, I thought I'm going to find something, but I didn't, at least until now. However, this would explain why the Book of the Epoch contains the above quoted prohibition of selling silk commodities to Jews. These Jews were working as independent workers in the silk manufacturers in Constantinople, and thus were able to take advantage of their position in order to satisfy the wishes of their customers outside Constantinople or even outside the empire. The Jewish silk workers <coughs> served as middlemen because of their easy access to the international Jewish trade works, uh, networks, and the imperial authorities tried to put an end to these illicit activities. Under these circumstances, it is not astonishing that Jewish silk workers and dyers are attested to in greater numbers in Byzantium. Working as independent freelancers, they could carry on their crafts in a quite undisturbed manner. When Roger II of Sicily attacked Corinth and Thebes in 1147, as I already mentioned, he did not only take away the Christian silk workers, but also the Jews. When the Byzantine emperor started negotiations for their return, the Jews were not ransomed and remained in Sicily. Several centuries later, in 1231, Frederick II of Sicily created a state monopoly over silk production there, to be manned and handled almost exclusively by Jewish craftsmen and entrepreneurs. The only disadvantage of this arrangement consist consisted of the fact that the Jewish silk manufacturers became serfs of the royal chamber. This category did not exist in Byzantium. In general, the Jews in Byzantium enjoyed relative freedom in their choice of profession. Only functions in civil service, as well as the membership in the guilds, were forbidden to them. Michael Toch characterized the situation of the Jews in Byzantium as follows. Of all the European juries, Byzantium provides the most articulate evidence in place already in late antiquity for a broad occupational range and especially for a continuous and apparently widespread engagement in crafts. The Byzantine state, though no great friend of the Jews, did not marginalize them in their occupations." End of quote. 
So does the evidence presented here allow the conclusion that Jews were somehow more integrated into the Byzantine society than their fellows in Ashkenaz? Recently, a large number of papers and books present evidence that the Jewish communities in Ashkenaz by no means lived in a world isolated from the surroundings. Quite the opposite to be, seems to be true. So I'm thinking I'm going to skip. What does the time say? Okay, so in this context, it might be helpful to have a look at some of the cultural and social conditions that Jews lived in, which may be responsible for the less violent relationship between the Jews and their Byzantine Orthodox countrymen. The aspect of Jewish engagement in Byzantine crafts we looked upon here is but one important element of the answer to, to this question. Several other factors should be taken into account such as the continuous settlement of Jews in the Byzantine urban centers, the legal situation, the mutual collective views on each other expressed in polemics, Christian on Jews and vice versa, and the social cultural aspect of a commonly used language in oral as well as written communication. The linguistic situation prevalent in Byzantium with Greek being the spoken and written medium of communication is much more in common with the situation in the Arabic speaking countries than the one in Christian Spain, France, or the Holy Roman Empire. This adds to the factors that have to be taken into account when asking the question about violence between religions, the Jewish, non-Jewish relations, and their historical context. And I just brought you here examples of Judah Hadassi's Greek. He's using a lot of Greek paraphrases in Eshkol HaKofer. And these paraphrases actually show us that he does not only have access to the vernacular level of Greek, but he actually uses classical Greek philosophical terminology, which may lead to the assumption that he did not only speak Greek, but also read it. But this is a question that is discussed in the publication that I'm uh, that I noted here, because um, these new this new evidence really shows us the, the level of integration of the Byzantine Jews into the Byzantine society. Another important aspect may be that during the Middle Ages, Byzantium was a central cultural and political power. Constantinople was its thriving capital, culturally much more advanced and up to date than Paris, Rome, or Bologna at that time. Its position as a regional and cultural hub between East and West facilitated cultural exchange and transfer between the various cultural ethnic religious groups mentioned meeting in Kushta. The Jewish community was only one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Saskia. Um, I will give the applause for all the other uh, um, participants, I guess, and I think we start the discussion. Merav, can you still join us for a few minutes? I have to, you have to leave. You are no, still... no, it's okay. It's okay. Now it's okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So I try to uh, get the questions in the, in the right order, but I, I think I will, I will, uh, take another order just to put together questions who are uh, connected. Um, so that's why I would like to start with just, it's a remark of uh, Tanya Potov, and uh, she uh, wrote about a find uh, they had in, in Cologne in the Jewish quarter. Um, and she says, thank you for sharing the quotation of Eli Eliezer Benuel Halevi. Uh, it just gave me, as a her, um, Tanya, an idea of a small archaeological find in Cologne. It was for Meraf, sorry for that. Uh, it's for Meraf. Um, an archaeological find in Cologne, we have had problems to interpret. 
uh, because it's a small class with an Ave Maria inscription found in the destruction layer of the pogrom of 1349. We were wondering if it is a pond object, but it only weighs three crumbs and cannot have been very costly, but I have to say it's now Maria speaking, even three crumbs of silver has a several, uh, several um, um, uh, 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 weight. Right. So yes, um, when I understood you right now, it's Tanya again as, as, uh, talking, it's existence in a Jewish context does not uh, have to be a problem at all. So do you want, Merav, do you want to say something to answer that or just? Yes, I, yes of course. Um, when, I, uh, when I'm answering that, I'm answering all, I think. Okay, and yeah, I think because all this, yeah. everything is connected to. Uh, okay. So I, I can say, uh, yes, uh, the question is not, uh, was it uh, was it allowed or not allowed? It's not a yes or no answer. It's when, where, and who. Because when we are talking about Northern France in the beginning of 12th century, and I didn't mention Rashi. I was supposed to, but I didn't know <laughs> if it's not too much to add in, because I, I really can point on the moment his, his student and his uh, son-in-law, uh, Rivan, he, he started it. This is the time that Troyes and the area became a, a really huge center. This is the place of the fair, a very important fair. So I really connecting, I'm connecting the economic needs uh, the, uh, to the, this halachic change. And they did went with cross on, and not only jewelry, also coats with cross on, uh, even a worship coat of uh, of uh, you know um, that used in uh, in the in the cathedral. So we even we have I can I can read it in Hebrew, uh, if you would wish later. Uh, it's amazing. They are talking about fashion. They are talking about garments that are now in fashion and we want to be in fashion. They are talking about jewelry that are in fashion now. And sometimes you, we can see that uh, the rabbis are asking, please make a chabala, break this here, change it here, and then you can go with it, but don't change it completely, don't melt it completely, because this is a beautiful artifact at the end, even though it is Mary on with Mary on and uh, the cross on. It's amazing because they have uh, details on how this uh, brooch is looking exactly how Mary is pointing and the hand is here and the her, her hand is left. It's amazing. And they are talking about wearing and going out. This is not the jeweler discussion anymore. This is the point. Because jeweler can melt it. Others can walk with fashionable items out. And this is the discussion, I think. So, so this was already the answer to uh, Leo Jacobi's question. Uh, did the rabbis permit wearing a cross or just owing it as a pawn? Maybe later, I think that Andreas wrote it. Yeah. I assume that from the end of the 13th century, we can see also the change in the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, I'm sure that it's, it's connected from uh, Maharam of Rutenburg and the Roche. Uh, that are trying to change this uh, reality. They don't wish, uh, they don't like this disintegration. These, these Christian's motives, because they are so clearly um, connected to the Christian ritual. Yeah, so I, I can, yeah, I can understand why people are asking that. So that's quite interesting. I, it was one one of my questions. If you uh, could, um, if you could connect 
these, um, these, and, and it, it fits now, uh, if you could connect these descriptions with real objects they were found, if there are some objects you can see, uh, can say it's very close to the description here or there. Is there something like that? Because we have so, we have not so many objects from that time. So that's the, the, the next problem. So yeah, yes, I, 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 I would like to just uh, to point that this is the, this is the beginning of this, but I'm in the beginning of this specific research. So I, I didn't want to put all these descriptions because they're wonderful. I, and I, I'm, I was looking for similar objects and I couldn't find the exact uh, uh, descriptions. Even I, I'm talking about descriptions of Mary on the brooch. I didn't, I didn't find any, any similar objects from the era. So maybe we have here an opportunity to, to get familiar to objects that gone. And we don't have any, any samples of these obje objects today in material. So that's why you, I, I heard you, you were a bit, uh, <laughs> I, I did want to see some jewelry. I didn't want to put any jewelry on object I, I mean pictures of objects because i was not sure that i'm putting the right object and i wanted to be precise that's why i am still in the uh, not in the material object i'm still in the halachic discussion because it's it's much to to be done there yet a, a long way to go yes <laughs> There are already um, hints to that in the discussion in the chat um, and asking for follow-up uh, seminars or workshops um, uh, for reading halachic sources and to dis discuss how to how to interpret. Um, sorry, Meraf, I would like to 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 skip to Saskia just for uh, some just to to make the change between the two of us. Um, the first question for Saskia is coming from Isaac Lifshitz. Uh, he's saying he, it is amazing to see that the murex was used in this area, in the Byzantine area, uh, era. Um, no mention of the uh, color azure. Uh, do you have uh, references for that? Um, not as far, as far as I can remember. The problem is that we don't have real, I mean, there are not many sources, um, as you saw. I hope that I would find more in the preparation of this lecture, but uh, nothing that I, I, I didn't find it. The only mentioning of color at all that I found was Argaman, which of course is very important because you have, this is purple, this is reserved for actual for the court, for the use at the, of, the, of the emperor himself. Um, so this kind of gives us, gives us uh, an impression of where in a social level, these Jews that were involved in silk production and uh, dying with, uh, with purple are living in more or less. But um, to really have detailed information about how this worked, I couldn't find it yet. I probably have to turn to the Byzantine sources because I searched the Hebrew ones and I didn't find very much. Um, the next step would be now to really go to the Byzantine sources and see if we can find more information there. Okay, then I would like to, to just add the next question to you, Saskia, uh, from Jack Hartner. Um, first, he was uh, he's thanking you for this fascinating presentation. And he has two quick questions, even if it's much to read. Um, so I hope it, it will be quick. Um, the first one is regarding surviving silks, Jewish and otherwise, how much of this material survives today? It could be a question of from me, um, even in fragmentary form. Uh, and which collections would be the place, places to search them out? Um, I actually was looking for pictures. I was really hoping to find something. That is uh, that uh, pertaining to this uh, to the period that I was talking about, like the tenth between the tenth and the and the fifteenth century, and I have to say that I didn't really find much. 
um, one of the sources that I was looking into was the catalog of the um, Byzantium and Islam exhibition that was had been um, organized in New York a couple of years ago. There, actually, there was this, there were displayed a lot of uh, silk garments, but all everything that is displayed there is either located in Egypt or in Syria before the 10th century, or it's even earlier. They even have some. Um, um, some tiny parts left over from, from the 6th century. But all of this is not really relating to the period I actually was talking about, um, the period of Jews that we have written resources on, that when Jews were involved in the silk trade and in the silk production. So between the 10th and 15th, 15th century, I couldn't find anything. But I have to say that due to Corona, I couldn't go to the library and really have a look at catalogs and look for them uh, for these, um, for especially these uh, products. But I really hope that I can do it when, whenever the libraries are going to be open again. At least here in Germany, still everything is closed. Fingers crossed, <laughs> we're all waiting for that. Um, the second uh, question of Jack, um, is uh, Benjamin's itinerary uh, also mentions Jewish dyers in Brindisi. Obviously, the, this is a city with very close links to Byzantium, uh, but I, I was wondering, as he was wondering, uh, if your sources hint at any other connections between a larger network of Jewish textile workers across Europe, uh, maybe links between those in Brindisi and Constantinople. And he's thanking you bef beforehand. Um, well, of course, we know about the special situation um, concerning southern Italy and the special connection to Byzantium, because it was part of the empire, at least uh, from, from the 5th or the 6th until the 10th century. Um, so there's probably much connection between southern Italian dyers. Uh, we also have, uh, there is a uh, an epigraphical evidence of a dyer in Corinth that kind of may be related to southern Italy, but the, the reading of the source is still very difficult. Um, there probably was a network. Um, Merav had this very beautiful picture of trade routes in Europe. And uh, if you can, if you look at Constantinople, of course, it's in the center of most of the trading routes between east and west and north and south. The only direct connection that I could make out from the sources I read is of course between Crete and Constantinople and the letter from the Cairo Geniza that I showed in my presentation. Um, but this is more or less everything that I can be safe, that I can say for sure. All the rest is more, more or less conjecture from the sources, from what the sources say, and from the general situation that we know about economically, that Byzantium, of course, was connected um, to every, more or less every important uh, trade center in the Middle East as well as in Europe. So probably the Jews were part of that network. But in, um, to really trace a network like that would need much more research that I'm hoping to be able to do in the future. Because okay, um, all uh, both lectures were dealing with garments and the uh, Christian Judeo um, um, connections between that, I would like to combine two questions, um, maybe to both of you. Uh, one is coming from Karin Czech uh, to Merav. You mentioned that, that Jews were being uh, allowed to wear clerical garments. Wouldn't this have caused problems with the Christians? And I would like to add my own uh, uh, question to Saskia. Um, if the Jews were producing textiles for Christians, did there were no problems producing textiles with Christian ornaments in the woven uh, 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 ornamentation or something. So this, these two sides of the same metal, I guess. Um, I don't know who want to start, but I, I thought this could be connected very good. 
Merav, you want to start? Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, so, um, wait. Yeah. Um, maybe I will start with the second question because uh, I, I, of course, I met this uh, this argument. They are actually saying if it it is not meant for worship, it, it they are using it for just or as an ornament. It is beautiful. They are using these words. So they can divide between the two, uh, uh, the, the, the two subjects, worship and decorate and, and the ornaments, decorating, decorating uh, fabrics, garments. If it is for decorating garments, it's okay, it's allowed. Even wearing this, not just doing it uh, for uh, Christians. So it's it is absolutely clear uh, when when I'm reading it, and uh, surprisingly, I didn't find for the second question, I didn't find any argument that Christians can say something that, about it that this is wrong. Maybe for that, you, one had to look to in, into Christian sources if they're. Uh, maybe a discussion was going on Jews using Christian um, objects yes, for their own. May yes, maybe, but but Jewish sources are not mentioning it. So it is uh, most uh, interesting. And of course, I have still work to do and I, I can find, but till now I didn't. Saskia? <laughs> Well, um, in my talk, I refer to, uh, to first of all, to the point that Jews were making dyeing garments with argaman with purple. So probably they were very much involved in producing garments for Christians. From a comment of Jacob Ben Reuven, we even can see that they were um, involved in the embroidering of Christian iconography, iconography in, in these garments. So he really says that actually that they have to, kind of, probably they had models or they had a, um, yeah, something that, that the Christians were giving to them, how it should look like. And then they were actually doing the weaving. Um, there is a big discussion in the Karaite sources about if you should be allowed, first of all, to wear shardnet, the mix, the mix of the silk and woolen, wool or uh, uh, silk, wool, uh, silk and sorry, silk and cotton or silk and linen. If you have a discussion like that, you can assume that probably people were doing it. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a discussion about it. So, and even there is a more harsh attitude uh, shown by Yuda Hadassi, who says, no, it's, it's forbidden. It's really forbidden to wear these garments. Whereas Jacob Ben Reuven seems to suggest that, well, maybe not, you don't have to be so you know, uh, strict on this matter. Um, so probably people were in, first of all, it's sure that they were involved in production of these garments, they may have even worn it. But this is, you know, this is really very hypothetical. Yeah. And uh, Isaac Lifshitz added to that, that, that Jews sold dorsals to churches with agreement of Ravan and garments for the priests. So they, um, if you produce that, I, I guess there should be some Christian ornaments. Okay, so I, I have to look that I don't forget any question. There was a question, it, just the discussion was run, running like that. So I didn't want it to, to switch to another point, but I don't, ha, I uh, don't have to forget this question from Nomi Feuchtwanger Zarik. Um, it is for Merav, uh, or it's not really a question, it's more like an, um, yes, saying something. Um, She's writing, citing from the Probiermusterbuch der Goldschmiede in the 16th century from Frankfurt am Main, 
Mordechai Narkis found references to spice boxes commissioned by wealthy Jews from local Christian artisans. Um, in the middle of the 16th century, for example, the master Johannes Strockelhecker, nice name, uh, brought in for registration by the city council a uh, Judenmonstrance, Jewish monstrance, using Christian ecclesiastic. Ecclesiastic, uh, ecclesiastic nomenclature to describe a Jewish ceremonial object of a similar form. The term Judenmonstrans suggests that there was a clear differentiation between the objects, most probably eliminating for the Jews the cross final, yes, and other Christian motifs that are, are their main iconographic characteristics. So it's a hint, a hint for the um, for the, the, the pieces that Goldsmiths uh, maybe was produce, uh, were producing for Christians and, and, um, and, and Jew, Jews. Um, and as we know how Goldsmiths were working, they had several um, just models to, to, to uh, produce uh, small forms and then put that all these ensemble together like you need it and you can produce from the same uh, from the same uh, material uh, a monstrance for the church and uh, uh, a spice box for a jewish household so i guess that's what she wants to say would you like to answer on that uh, no i actually I, I, thank you it's uh, it's it is most interesting and i i and then i i I can also relate it to some uh, uh, subjects that I just read about them. So thank you very much. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Merav. I also um, have another question for Saskia, um, if I find it. Uh, yeah, you. Um, you mentioned this uh, collaboration between the stonemason and the Christian companion. Can you say something more about that? Is it just this what we know, or is there anything more to to know about this uh, collaboration? Um, it's mentioned in a source, in a in a Greek source that I couldn't get access to because of the library closed. Um, we probably have to look for more archaeological evidence in Kanya itself and see how this fits together with this with this information. Um, unfortunately, I, I couldn't find anything else because, um, except for this mentioning. So I probably have to ask people who are more involved in archaeological uh, research uh, in Crete in order to find out some, something more about this exciting co cooperation I, I was puzzled by that as well so I hope I can find anything else about this I'm I'm not so puzzled about that but I, <laughs> I, I, I was lucky about that but um I, I, I yes but um uh yes I would like to know more about it uh, about it um I think because we are so good in, in the time I, I maybe we can open the discussion for people to ask their questions themselves because it's uh, much much easier than for me to to follow the chat uh, the next question please if you want to say something write it in the chat not not the whole term just I want to say something Thing. Uh, that's why I would like to to give the, the word to Ilana. He, she has a question to Merav, and it's much easier if she is asking it. Yes, well, thank you so much, uh, Maria. Uh, my question was whether the uh, uh, permission to wear this, well, this fashionable, trendy clothing and jewelry was a, a form of appeasement towards the host society. This is why the rabbis ruled that they can actually uh, go and wear this kind of garments. That's my question. Yes, I, I actually it's all it's always amazing for me because I am dealing with these aspects for many years now, with jewelry and uh, and garments. And it's always the same, the same place, the same rabbis, the same uh, view. And I'm sure 
that in northern France, in that specific uh, areas, something, the connection with the Christians were different. And at the same era, era specific era, and um, I'm sure that they try to connect and become uh, become part through these uh, visible items. And um, uh, yes, yes, uh, um, of course, it could <laughs> this be. is my answer. It could be then. Yes. It's possible. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Merat and Ilana, and there was a remark by Eva Freumovic. Eva, would you like to take over? Come from whom? No, no, I, I don't. No, I just posted just, you know, for people who want to look at silks, um, especially for German readers, uh, I would start with Saint Sankt Severin in Cologne. It's very difficult to actually get to see, but it's possible somehow. Well, not at the moment. At the moment, nothing's possible. But um, I've posted. Um, uh, I've posted something that people can read. I know it. It you know you look at this title and it doesn't tell you any. It doesn't say anything about silk, but I managed to get into that underground treasure, treasury, uh, in the crypt, uh, and it. This it it took my breath away. So yeah, uh, if I might add that probably the right place in order to look for these garments are all these museums of the churches and of the cathedrals. I just remember uh, the cathedral in Hildesheim where I grew up. In the museum of the cathedral in Hildesheim, we have these silk garments which probably also came from Byzantium or surely came from Byzantium. Um, so there is a lot of silk material even in Western Europe because it was, you know, as I said, usually it is a, it was a political, it was one element of political gift exchange between Byzantium and the West. Um, so yeah, actually adding to the to, or answering the question that I kind of skipped in my previous answer. I, I mean, this is the area where you have to start looking for these silk garments. Um, as for Greece itself, I probably have to really start looking there too, but then we'll have to wait for all the situation to be ended and be able to travel again. Um, yeah, Tanya added uh, a hint to an exhibition about silk in reliquaries in Essen um, a few years ago. Tanya, do you know there is, if, if there is a publication on this ex exhibition? If you, if I we think, have... I think there was a small booklet. I have, I have it in, I, I have to look up uh, the quotation. I don't have it actually, but, um, the interesting thing about um, Essen is uh, that it was a monastery uh, with a very close relationship uh, to the Ottonian dynasty. And I think they had access to, to all these imperial um, Byzantine silks. So this might be quite interesting to, to have a look into that. Yeah, perfect. If you would find it, just uh, send it to the chat or just to the organizers. So yeah. uh, Eva is asking uh, already for uh, a reading list um, on Byzantine silk, so we can just we can use now our our group here to yeah. to collect maybe a list like that. Yeah. So well, there's always a worth looking uh, for the publications of uh, Leonie uh, von Wilkins. Um, in the, um, how do you say, uh, Riggesberg in, in, uh, in Swiss. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Abeg Stiftung, Abeg yeah. Stiftung, yeah. Um, okay, I hope I didn't forget, I forgot any uh, uh, questions. Um, are there more questions, any remarks? Would you like to say something? Um, ask the lecturers, uh, if not, well, actually, I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, because of this, 
um, interpretation of Benjamin's remarks, um, saying that that maybe he only related to a kind of Jewish guild of silk workers. And I remember that yesterday in the session with Esperanza Valls, um, actually there was a, there were questions regarding to to this organ institution. So if anybody has any information about really the existence of Jewish guilds in the Middle Ages uh, for certain professions, I would be very much interested in that. I can jump in here. We have. Um... We have in Bohemia at the very end of the Middle Ages, and then, of course, early modern times, we have lots of Jewish guilds. And it's been described by, among others, by uh, Marco Wischnitzer in his book. Yeah, yeah I know that. I, I just found it <laughs> when I was preparing the lecture. But I wondered if, you know, in the archives of Girona and all these. Um, new material that has been found in recent years, there may have been maybe any more evidence to an existence of this kind of organization already before the 16th century. Yeah, it seems like uh, the audience would have the answer right now. But can I, can I ask one question uh, to Saskia? Hi, Rachel. Hi, how are you? Um, Saskia, just to follow up um, your discussion of the tanners and the silk dyers, um, Sophia Schmidt and I have been working on one rabbinic responsum from the late 13th century that refers to a man from Ashkenaz, somewhere in Germany, um, who went to Rome, Romi um, is the way it appears in the, uh, in the responsum, to study the art of tanning. Um, later, he um, became a recalcitrant spouse and ran away, um, abandoning his wife. And that's, that was the context for this responsum. Um, but in any case that we were, we were wondering um, what specifically Romi might refer to. Um, obviously it does not need necessarily to refer to Rome in Italy. Um, and your lecture um, has sort of confirmed for us that perhaps it really refers to the Eastern, the Eastern Roman empire kind of, um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I'm happy to share the source with you afterwards. Yeah, sure. I mean, this would be very probably probable that he actually went to either one of the centers in. Uh, yeah, I mean, he could have he could have gone to Constantinople in, um, itself. Um, Southern Italy also would be a kind of area where you find all these dyeing and uh, tanning um, centers. It's always difficult if you have these quotations about Romi or Rumi or whatever. Um, I'm not aware of a dying center or any evidence of uh, Jewish craftsmanship in that, in that profession in Rome. I'm sure that there was something in Italy. I mean, there was a kind of competition between Italy and Byzantium in, uh, in silk production as well as in dying. So, it might very much be possible that he either went to Southern Italy, which is during that time, I'm not sure if it really fits in. I would, I would go for Byzantium actually. <laughs> I really would go for one of the centers or Constantinople or Thebes or Corinth, maybe. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's kind of what we suspected and, and uh, Sophia and I were just chatting before and said that your lecture kind of confirms that for us. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, I got just I got uh, a message that we have to go into the break. Uh, thank you, Andreas. <laughs> um, and I got another message from Isaac that he has exactly the same topic in his paper he will give uh, in a few minutes. Um, so thank you again uh, to Merav and Saskia for the wonderful talks. Thank you all for this discussion, this uh, very uh, vivid discussion. Um, I, I'm afraid we couldn't uh, really discuss every every question, every remark uh, you made, but maybe we will have it. Uh, we will have the time in the end. Um, 
We will have only a very short break now because we have to start the following session 15 minutes earlier. That means we will start at 11.45 because Isaac Lischitz has to leave earlier at the end of the session. So we only have 16 minutes now following my clock. Um, uh, time to get a coffee, to take a little walk outside and be back here uh, at uh, 11 45 or 10 45 for the German uh, audience. See you in 15 minutes. Thank you all again. It was a very, very fun session. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to our fifth session we entitled Christian Guilds and Jewish Craftspeople. I'm chairing the session. My name is Andreas Lenartz, and we will have two speakers, uh, Joseph Isaac Lifschitz and Birgit Wiedel. Joseph Isaac Lifschitz, Dr. Isaac Lifschitz, who will uh, start first, uh, is a research uh, associate at the Go Goldstein Goren Diaspora Research Center at Tel Aviv University and a senior lecturer at Shalem College. His books include Rabbi May of Rotenburg and the Foundation of Jewish Political Thought and One God, Many Images, Dialectical Thought in Hasidei Ashkenaz. And he will speak to us today about the topic, a story of a leather worker as a possible way of breaking the guilt ban. Isaac, please. Thank you very much. Before I, uh, well, I should share it now. Okay. Um, no, this is not the one. This is me. Did I lose it? Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I called it. Um, uh, leather workers and not tanners. Uh, Rachel first started, I was uh, already shivering uh, when Rachel first mentioned this, uh, this responsum of, um, the, of this tanner who left to Rome. The remark of Zaskia about what is Rome was, is very, very important for me. But uh, initially I wanted to um, dedicate this speech to the to this paper, especially to this uh, to this case. But since I spoke about it already in IMC at Leeds in the Zoom IMC last year, um, I decided to enlarge it, especially when I uh, bumped into the information I'm going to share with you today. Um, I I'm going to speak about tenors, but mainly about um, Par uh, parchmentiers, people who uh, prepare parchment. Um, just a few pictures, just to get into the... So this is tanning, right? The working on leather, um, the material that is used for tanning is different from the material that is used for, for to prepare parchments. Um, I'm not going to get into all these uh, gory uh, technical differences, but just to... Um, I collected some beautiful pictures. So this is the leather before, this is the parchment after, and this is preparing the parchment. Um, Mark showed yesterday beautiful pictures as well. Uh, you can see that the knife that is used is uh, rounded at the sides so not to avoid making holes in the parchment. And the pegs on the four sides of the frame are made in a way to stretch the parchment after it's uh, dried and connected to the frame. I'll get into the details uh, soon later. These are more pictures of, and that's parchment. Okay, um, we'll leave it with some nice pictures, maybe this one, and I'll start my paper. In the high middle ages, parchment was still the common object of writing. Papyrus and paper did not arrive to Europe until the 13th century. Parchment was leather of calf, sheep, or goat. And I should add in Northern Europe, mainly calf, which was usually smoothened on both sides 
So it could be used for books or contracts, writing contracts. Parchment was also made from skin of deers and of calf fetus, which was mentioned the, uh, already yesterday by Mark, um, which was found in the, the uterus of cows after they were slaughtered. Parchment production was a craft that was different from tanning. It involved soaking the leather in water and other materials. In the Middle Ages, it was mainly soaked in lime, water with lime, dried up, stretched, and smoothened on both sides. For Jewish sacred scriptures, parchment was prepared um, as a one-sided parchment only. Jews used parchment as a writing material besides for sacred objects, for letters, contracts, personal notebooks, and books, which were also written both sides, as we, as we can see in uh, Machzorim and uh, Sidurim. Parchment was not cheap. Since Halachic responsa was written on parchment, I suspect that when questions were sent to res uh, respected rabbis, a clear parchment was sent along uh, with a written question in order to available the rabbis with written material. I must add before, before I continue that Malachi Bataria wrote an, an uh, amazing paper uh, book on, on the subject and uh, there is a chapter on parchment making and uh, I learned from him that we, uh, there are some responses that it says, uh, and I don't have any more cloth, but it also says the Sarah Elef, I think Sarah Elef, Arelacha Kelef. So uh, he mentions that, uh, that the pronunciation should be Kelef, or used to be Kelef, and not cloth. Very interesting, and I continue. Um, who made the parchment for the purpose of sacred scriptures in Ashkenaz? Malachi Batari assumed that since halacha demands that the parchment should be uh, produced for writing the sacred script, it could only be written by non uh, it could could be written by non-Jews because they do not make it especially for the sacred purposes. I would like to show that this was not the case, at least until the 12th century. But started changing slowly since the second half of the second century because of halachic change. And th that's where halacha or changes in halacha, or as I like to say, the introduction of the Talmudic law uh, changed the, the use of, of uh, parchment. So was, uh, the change was mostly related to Rabbi Nutan. It was believed that Jews were not involved in, in artisanship. Jews were merchants and later money, money leaders but not tailors, contractors, or tanners, as we find in Sefer Hasidim. I would like to continue now with my uh, presentation. And for a moment, to read the story of this, uh, to, um, of this man, of this tanner. As a story told, we learn that the young man who left his uh, newlywed in Germany to study the craft of tanning in Rome I left it Rome. Again, Zaskia, thank you for your remark, or Rachel uh, first. It shouldn't be just Rome. That's the way it's, it's defined but in the response as Rachel mentioned before. When he came back, his father-in-law, Naftali, was upset with his son-in-law for leaving his daughter. Demanded that he will divorce his daughter. The young man uh, promised to stay with his wife, and then he said he must go back to Rome to work there. Apparently, he planned to come back to Germany every so often to visit his wife, a plan that his father-in-law was not very happy. The rabbis found this plan to be unfair uh, the, uh, for the wife, I should add, and ordered a divorce. The two rabbis, one of them was the son, the uh, two of them were the son of uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Medina, Isaac from Vin, of Chaim Ozerou and his uh, nephew, the son of a different son of Rabbi Al-Azhar from Vin, Rabbi Avraham, who he learned that he was murdered in one of the massacres. His son Menachem, which, who is a grandson of Rabbi Yitzchak Mevina, thought that the divorce should be forced on this tenor. So um, again, I spoke about it in the IMC. I'm not going to repeat it, but I'll um, but I'll continue with what uh, with my uh, with my paper. 
Okay, so the first source is from the Talmud. The rabbi, sa uh, the rabbi says, there is no profession that uh, disappears from the world. Happy is who sees his parents having a good profession. Poor is, poor is the one who sees his parents having a bad profession. The world can't function without the perf perfumers and without tanners. Happy is who his profession is a perf performer. Poor is who his profession is a tanner. <laughs> In other words, um, here they refer to the smell that comes out of the, the order that comes out of uh, these professions. So tanning or making parchment, the smell sticks to you. And that's not a good idea or not a good profession, but what can we do? We can't always choose our profession. So the rabbis didn't like tanners or parchment makers. Um, and the following are compelled to divorce, a leper and one who has an offensive nasal order, a gather, it's collecting dog do from the streets. This was a, a profession of, the, of antiquity, a copper miner and a tanner. Whether they were before they were married or after, it's always a, a reason for divorce. And from Sefer Hasidim, that, that a quote that should, uh, should be in front of all of us in this, uh, in this conference. It will never happen that a Jew will be born in a zodiac sign of a non-Jew, uh, Jewish profession, like, what are the non-Jewish professions? Tanners, constructors, and tailors in our towns that are not doing any craft and are not used to doing any craft. So uh, all historians that, that studied um, the profession of Jews, um, th this is always quoted and I think it should be quoted here again, but, Um, before I, I continue with the, with the next uh, quote, I want to continue with my, with my paper. What we learned from the case of the tanner who went to Rome, acquiring a, a craft as ta ta uh, tanning was not possible in Germany, probably because of the objection of German tanners in the guilds. We may suspect that working as a tanner in Germany wasn't that simple either. On, other, uh, on the other hand, we may learn that studying a craft elsewhere was a possibility to get out of the guild uh, uh, constructions. Regarding part parchment years, we have uh, one testimony. As Sarik Shalev Eni had showed uh, of a document from uh, archives of the city of uh, Eslingen from the year um, 1331 of a Jew requiring to be admitted to the guild of parchment years, indeed, and then he has to pay to the guild. Indeed, even at the end of the 13th century, a, a production of parchment was not co a, a common craft among Jews, as testifies the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher. Rabbeinu Asher relates to the common halachic suspicion I'm sorry, the common halachic assumption that Jew, uh, Jewish preparation of the parchment was not considered necessary. That is was what Rashi says and quoted later by Baruch, Rabbi Baruch from Worms. Uh, uh, I'm talking about Sefer Atuma. It was not until Rabbeinu Tam in the 12th century, right? The second half of the 20th, no, the first half of the 12th century, that the Jewish craftsmanship was necessary. Rabbeinu Tam insisted upon his understanding of the Talmud that parchment should be produced uh, for the purpose of religious use. Parchment for Sefer Torah, Tfilim, or Mezuzah should be produced for their purpose only, what is called Lishma. But Rabbeinu Tam did not only demand that the Jews should produce their own parchment, he uh, also gave an author, uh, authorization to the medieval new technique of uh, producing, producing parchments. Um, I would like to claim that this is, is um, that 
uh, to claim that his two rulings are related, which means to produce the parchment for the purpose of, um, of the sacred uh, script and that he, um, that he authorized that the new way of producing parchment um, is kosher. I would like to start with this, uh, with this uh, quote in the presentation. Regarding Megillat Esther, it happened to me that I had a Megillah that was written in my own script. Um, if the English will sound a bit awkward, the Hebrew is even worse. That's, um, not everybody was Maimonides. Um, it happened to me that I had a Megillah that was written in my own script and I couldn't find parchment that were made specifically for the sanctity of Megillah. So I bought leather, placed it in a, con a container of lime, removed, removed it from the container. And when it was placed in water by one of my boys and all the hair was removed by the boys and I helped in all activities and that's the way it is in Hebrew. And I wrote another Megillah and both are in my possession. In other words, uh, Rabbeinu Tam claims that he himself produced the parchment or at least helped to produce it by himself with his boys, meaning, uh, meaning that it all was under his uh, possession and he wrote himself the Megillah. This is the uh, testimony that I have uh, that Malachi Betaria quotes uh, Sarit Shalev Aini. If a Jew wished to join them, the guild of the parchmentiers, uh, he would have to buy his membership in the guild and at the same time maintain the practice of his religion. Okay, um, what I want to do before I continue is to um, to describe the changes of uh, producing parchment. How is the time? Not good. Okay, parchment production went through a change at the eighth century. In antiquity, there were five types of uh, produ uh, producing parchment, either by smoking, anointing the leather, soaking in minerals, soaking in minerals and herbs, or soaking solely in herbs. It was the, la the latter that was the, the technique recommended by the sages of the Talmud, as they call it, uh, uh, klaf afutz, afatzim. This technique included soaking in salted water, then washing it, then soaking in water containing uh, barely flour, then again washing it, and then in water that was mixed with gall, which glued the leather por uh, pores. Lastly, the leather was stretched on a frame of wood as we saw in the pictures, uh, before the leather was dried up and its external skin, the epidermis, was peeled very easily off before it dried from the inner part, the dermis, thus the leather was divided to two parts, which were called klaf or kelef. That's the outer side of the of the parchment, of the of, of the leather, and duxustus, which was the inner part of the leather. This was in antiquity until the eighth century. From the eighth century, um, especially in the West, a new technolo technology was introduced. The leather was soaked in water. Later with water and lime. The hair was removed naturally by the lime and the leather, leather was placed in, a, in water again, dried up and framed. At this stage, it was smoothened with knives as we saw in the, in the, in the presentation. I'll show again. This is when it's on a, on a frame and it's smoothened with a knife in both sides. So it can be used for reading. Um, scholars in the Middle Ages were aware of the technological changes. They were aware that their leather is not made the same as it was used in, antiqu in antiquity in the Talmud. Um, they were worried that the changes reduced the authenticity or the sanctity of their sacred scripts. The first to claim that 
the medieval, medieval production was kosher, was okay for writing scripts, was Rabbeinu Tam, to the extent that they are even better than the parchment of antiquity. Um, but scholars were also worried about the status of medieval parchment. Why shouldn't it be considered as duxustus? I want to explain. Um, when the hair was removed with the knife, the external, the epidermis, the external part of the parchment was removed as well. So you're left with, part, with leather that is, only, um, that is only the internal side, um, which is called parchment, unlike the peeled epidermis that was used in antiquity. And um, the Talmud orders that even if mezuzah is kosher with this kind of leather or parchment, for tefillin or sefer Torah, you need the thinner external part, the epidermis. And if that's uh, erased with knives, uh, that means that their leather is not kosher. And there are all kinds of responsa and alachic rulings saying that that's what we have. It's better to use sefer Torah that isn't as authentic or as it was used in the Talmud, but this, that, that's what we have and that's what we should use. But people felt guilty about it and felt squeamish about the differences of parchment from the Talmud and their time. Rabbein Tam, on the other hand, sorry. I'll show you here. And our parchments have the halachic status of cloth. And we write on them Sefer Torah, Tfilin, and Mezuzot in the inner side, and not uh, whoever claims that the parchment are considered duxustus, the non-kosher non cloth, because the parchments removed from external screen, et, et cetera. Because if this is true, how can we write Tfilin on such parchments? So that's Tosfot. Um, okay. Before I continue reading, um, a reading from the, the, the presentation, I'll, I come back to my paper. As mentioned before, Rashi holds that it is, not, it is not necessary to produce parchment for sacred use. Parchment may be bought from any uh, person who prepares parchment. What gives the, sanct the sanctity is writing, not producing the parchment. That's what Rashi holds. Rabbi Nutan disagrees with Rashi and tells us that he himself produced parchment as we saw before. So Rashi claims, as we see in this, in this place, the Talmud says, Tchelet can be bought from a, a certified maker only. Feeling should be checked and, and um, right here. And um, it's my, my translation, I can't even read myself. Um, the certification I meant is not necessary. Sifrei Torah and Mezuzot should be checked and can be bought from anybody because everybody can see if they're written correctly or not. And Rashi says, because it is not required to produce their parchment specifically for the sake of tefillin, Zifere Torah and Mezuzot. Therefore, when we find a Sefer Torah and it's written correctly, nobody cares about where the parchment was bought. If that's the case, the uh, assumption of Melachi Betarie that parchment was produced by Jews is incorrect. Rashi permits, and I, hold, I, I understand that that's all, all rabbis, all the sages of until the time of Rabbi Nutam were not bothered by the fact that parchment was not made by Jews. So if a Jew wanted to buy parchment, he just went to the parchment producer and bought parchment for him, for himself. I'll skip this quote. Rabbi Nutam, on the other hand, says that our make of parchment is better than their immersion in Golnat. But it has to be made for the sake of Sefer Torah or Tfilin. How am I with the time? Okay. Um, what I would like to claim that these two assumptions here are connected. Rabbi Mutam, on the one hand, was not happy with the 
uh, tradition or the custom in Ashkenaz to buy parchment from anybody. He felt that parchment should be made for the sake of Sefer Torah. On the other hand, he assumed that um, because that the quality of parchment uh, in, in the Middle Ages was very good, excuse me, he thought that it was even better than in antiquity. Therefore, there is no problem using that kind of parchment, even though it's not the caliph, it's not the epidermis, it's just the inner side, but the quality is so good that everything can be written on it. I think that because he felt that the modern medieval production of uh, parchment is as good as in antiquity, um, it creates a halachic status, that meaning that producing the parchment is equal to the production of parchment in, in antiquity. Therefore, it demands a, um, a halachic or intention for making it for the sake of, uh, for the purpose of Sefer Torah or Tfilin. Therefore, he gave to it, he gave to the medieval te technology a halachic status. So on the, on, on the one hand, he was more stringent. He, uh, he demanded it was it would be made by Jews. On the other hand, he, um, uh, he permitted the, um, the medieval technology as a halachic process. Um, uh, I, I believe that his ruling, uh, which is quoted by many rabbis after Ben Utam, I believe that that what uh, created the change or gave the authority to Jews to start to produce parchment. So uh, I think that this halachic change from, from early medieval or early high medieval um, era to Rabbeinu Tam, to after the, second, uh, the 12th century, that created a change in the production of, um, of, uh, of parchment. Um, I would like to, to, to end with this, uh, with this claim. Uh, Chaim Soloveitchik showed how um, the laws of um, using wine that is only made by Jews created a, a whole artisanship of creating, creating uh, um, making wine by Jews. Jews became winers because of halachic demands. I think that the same case is true with parchment. Halachic demand by Rabbeinu Tam created, uh, created a new art craft by Jews producing parchment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isaac, for your talk. Uh, we will have questions after the second talk, so I will um, skip to the next um, talk by Birgit Wiedel. Dr. Wiedel is, uh, received her doctorate in 2002 from the University of Salzburg in Vienna in the fields of history, German and Russian philology, and her habilitatio for medieval uh, history at the University of Graz in 2016. She has been a staff member of the Institute for Jewish History in Austria since 2000, and a lecturer at the University of Salzburg and the University of Klagenfurt since 2009 and 2017, respectively. She is a co-author of uh, the ongoing series Regesten zur Geschichte der Juden in Österreich, that is uh, the Regester uh, for the History of the Jews in Austria, funded by the Austrian Science Fund with four volumes published, and I can tell you the fifth volume is very well on its way. <laughs> She's currently a leader of the FWF-sponsored project Documents on Jewish History in Southern and Western Austria, 1419 to 1437, and her main areas of research are medieval economic, medieval economic and social history, history of anti-Judaism, his, urban history, sources on the history of the Jews in the Middle Ages, and auxiliary sciences of history. She, Birgit will talk to us today about the topic 
basically everything. Uh, prohibitions, converts, and a Jewish guild, a search for Jewish craftspeople in late medieval Austria. Birgit. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me properly? And we do. We do. And you can and you can see the and you can see the the the, the slides. Okay. Yeah, thank you very. Why does it not? Uh, ah, okay. In. 1396, shortly after the death of the ruling duke, his successors Wilhelm and Albrecht IV of Austria received a request from the citizens of the upper Austrian town of Linz, who wanted their privileges and city rights reconfirmed, a quite typical procedure after ruler's death. Equally typical, the rulers amended or added regulations. In this case, they granted the citizens more ri wide-ranging rights to the practice of craftsmanship. The ducal toll keepers were banned from trade and craftsmanship, and similarly, the Jews of Linz were prohibited to practice any craftsmanship for the citizens of Linz. Legal regulations are, of course, a type of source one can draw only limited amounts of information from. Historians should be and are wary to read legal regulations at face value and equally wary of reading them as the opposite of what was happening, deductive, so to say, a positive from a negative. However, I would like to argue in cases like this, these additions are usually made at the request of the respective citizenry, reacting to their most pressing concerns, meaning at least to actual current wishes of the citizenry, which is why the political background, economic backgrounds, is always important. And the citizens in this uh, uh, case obviously wished that the Jews of Linz abstain from working as craftsmen, or at least in doing so interfere with the Christian craftsmen of the city, which also means that what we have here is not, as we can lead, read in literature, uh, a total ban of Jewish craftsmanship and suggests that uh, Jewish craftspeople existed in the city. In this paper, I want to sketch the traces of Jewish craftsmanship in late medieval Austria, by which I'm referring to today's borders, not to the duchy. And first off, not to get your hopes too high, the traces are very scarce, at least in the Christian sources, the Christian perception of Jewish craftsmanship I will focus on. I will try to trace them in legal codes as well as present the so far singular appearance of a Jewish convert as an artisan. Most of this grounds, and Andreas has mentioned it already, the ongoing project Regessen zur Geschichte der Juden in Österreich, and this is no cov covered advertising here since you can download the four volumes for free under the link uh, I have uh, put up here. As far as general prohibitions of Jewish craftsmanship for a specific territory or city are concerned, the above cited regulation from 1396 is already the last, meaning the only one for the Austrian territory we have found so far. It was though reconfirmed by the Duke's successors. However, hints at Jewish craftspeople can be found in Christian legal documents, particularly for three specific craft trades cloth trade and tailoring, working of precious metals, and butchery. In 1316, Duke Friedrich, at the time currying favor with most of the major Austrian cities due to his struggle with the Bavarian Duke for the royal crown, granted privileges to the city of Wiener Neustadt, one of the most loyal ducal towns, and to honor their immense loyalty, he ordered that henceforth no Jew shall cut any sort of cloth by hand in Neustadt. It is interesting to note that this is the concern the city had with the Jewish community, which was on its way to become the second largest of the Habsburg territories and the largest in the Duchy of Syria. Furthermore, Friedrich still used the privilege to emphasize his rule over the Jews and sneak in a little bonus for himself. Whenever a Jew violates this regulation, the judge of Wiener Neustadt shall take away all the cloth from him and hand it over to the ducal treasury. 
a clause that, again, with all precaution, makes it sound as if both Sitzi and Duke half expected some Jews in Wiener Neustadt to go against this ducal command and engage in cloth trade and or processing. It is not quite clear, though, to which activity the cutting of cloth is referring to, and I will come back to this uh, later on. It could mean a mere cutting of the bales, the rolls of cloth, as a description for the cloth trade, it could, however, also refer to tailoring itself, the production of clothes by Jewish tailors. While the interpretations, including my own a little bit, do lean towards the former explanation, the phrasing allows for speculation towards the latter, particularly if we take a look at later regulations of the tailor skills in which with, in which the topic of Jewish trading and processing of cloth remains of importance. While the earliest and quite extensive regulation of the tales of Vienna from 1340, and, and yes, this is early for Austria, so there's that, uh, does not mention any Jews and generally deals more with religious and social aspects, it, its economic counterpart from 1368 and 1369 does so, albeit as customers. The tales of Vienna had come before the city council and laid down their regulations that, among others, no tailor was allowed to work the tailoring craft in the city or its suburbs, neither among the Jews nor among the Christians, unless he was a citizen. A regulation that was adapted in a year later in the longer, very, very extensive regulations of 1369, which is unfortunately, as you can see here, only transmitted as, as a, a copy from, from much later. The shorter earlier of these regulations was noted down in the Viennese Handwerksordnungsbuch, a manuscript that compiles guild codes, municipal markets, regulations, oaths, and many more. And it's generally a very uh, a fascinating manuscript. It has been digitized and edited and is both online. I can, I can put up the, the links in the, in the chat afterwards if somebody uh, wishes to consult it. The manuscript uh, contains a second reference to potential possible Jewish cloth trading and processing with an, in my opinion, more explicit hint at actual Jewish activity. In 1397, the city council regulated the trading and processing of cloth in general. They gave privileges to merchants of cities from Northern Italy, Bohemia and Poland, defined the location within the city where cloth was allowed to be cut, processed and sold and allowed Christians to cut and sell cloth in general during the two annual markets. Outside these two markets, however, any of this was forbidden for both learned and unskilled workers and besunderlich den Juden, particularly for the Jews. So they really, really emphasize that it is forbidden, particularly for the Jews. Specific evidence of actual cloth trade and processing by Jews stems from Salzburg, then an independent archbishopric, today part of Austria, of course, with kind of a tragic background. In November 1404, the Nuremberg citizen, Konrad Lebsinger, confirms that he has received four rolls of cloth with a Jew, which the Jew Gumprecht had owed him, had remained owing him. These rolls, these bales of cloth, were handed to him by Archbishop Eberhard III, since Gumbrecht had most likely been killed along with the other Salzburg Jews in the persecution following a blood libel and host desecration accusation earlier in this year. And the Archbishop seems to have not only taken over the Jews' possessions, but also their outstanding debts, or in this case, uh, uh, handed over the, the cloth that probably has already been paid for by the Nuremberg citizen. Again, the question is whether we can count this as craftsmanship or should rather file it away as a no less interesting Jewish trade activity. However, I would argue for not drawing too strict a line between cloth trade and processing, mainly for the reason that this line is not drawn by the guilds themselves. 
The medieval regulations of Austrian tailors' guilds subsume cloth cutting as a part of their craftsman's work. The Viennese and later those of Wiener Neustadt jealously defending it against anyone outside the guilds, including the Jews. And I plan to ask my colleagues in Salzburg at the Municipal Archives for a copy of the unedited Taylor's regulation from 1386, whether they use the same wording when, well, this happened, so, so I refrain from uh, bothering them. Apart from cloth trade tailoring, we have already heard today about Jews as jewelers, as silversmiths. Again, the source material is scarce on Jews as metal workers in Austria, although the first Jewish inhabitants of Austria we know by name, Shlom worked in kind of his trade. He was master of the ducal mint of Duke Leopold V, who had this mint newly established, presumably with his share in the ransom for Richard the Lionheart. Unfortunately, this is about the extent of what we know about Shlom's activities in the minting business, and with his brutal death in 1196, he and his family were murdered by crusaders. The history of Jewish mint masters in Austria is already at its end again. Jews, however, were further engaged in the exchange and trade of gold and silver. And in 1368, they were together with anyone else who was not a member of the Hausgenossen, the 48 Viennese citizens who had the exclusive right to metal trade, minting, and money exchange. Together with anyone else, uh, the Jews were banned from selling or buying gold or silver. A specific exception, however, was made for the Jews who were allowed to sell their own precious objects and Christian pledges. Should other metals, however, the regulations continue, be found in their houses, the Jews would be punished and the metal, you can guess it, would be confiscated by the ducal treasury. A ducal regulation for the Viennese goldsmiths issued at the behest of St. Mintmaster and the Hausgenossen at around the same time, however, suggests broader activities of Jews and artisan metalworking. No goldsmith or anyone else, the regulation states, and then emphasizes, be he priest, layman, or Jew, shall carve a seal matrix without the safe knowledge that the customer is entitled to the seal. Furthermore, the location for the work is specified. No one should be allowed to work other than out in the open not in hidden chambers, not in secret rooms, and not unter den Juden among the Jews. Usually the phrase that is used for, for the Jewish lane or the Jewish quarter. And, and, and it's, it very much uh, reminded me when I, when I heard the discussion uh, just uh, uh, today about this, this changing of objects, this melting down of, of, of objects. So it all has to, has to happen out in the open, in theory. If the regulation continues, any of those illegal pieces were found, the representatives of the mint master should confiscate the seal or rather the matrix wherever they find it with Christians or with Jews, break it and surrender the pieces to the mint master. And it is noteworthy that around the same time, the first accusations of Jewish forgery of documents and seal, seals surface in Austria in a more general way in the extremely hostile preface of the Lost Judenbuch of Duke Albrecht II. And again, in a specific mention, which I have put up here, of an invalidation of a citizen's seals that has the by note, this is the first time that there has been counterfeiting among the Jews. So it is very interesting that this, this, uh, this accusation surfaced at the same, roughly at the same time uh, with, these, with these regulations of the, of the Goldsmiths Guild. Uh, the third craft I will keep rather short since much has already been discussed and written about the food sector, Jewish butchers, uh, butchers, shochets, and the obstacles or not they overcome when trying to sell the meat to Christian customers. 
Austrian cities, particularly in the Western parts, show many of the regulations we can find in other cities of the German speaking area, particularly in the South. Jews were allocated specific soul stalls at the town markets. Jews were only allowed to sell their meat at the Fleischbank, the municipal stall, where meats of sick or injured animals or foul meat was sold. Jewish meat, as they say in the sources, had to be announced to Christian customers. All this, of course, potential hints at how Jewish butchers might have been perceived as rivals by the Christian counterparts. However, and this is a big however, while some of these regulations appear in cities with a Jewish community, for example, Salzburg or the Syrian city of Judenburg, quite a lot found their way into municipal ordinances of towns for which we do not have any record of any Jewish presence ever. This applies particularly to towns then under the uh, rule of the Bavarian Duke, where these regulations appear in almost all of the municipal laws of small towns, which copied their town laws from the town law of Munich, which has these regulations as all the other towns just copied uh, the, Munich, the Munich town law. And it is furthermore interesting to know that in the towns with the largest Jewish communities and for which the presence of a Jewish slaughterhouse and shochet is documented, in Vienna, in Christian sources, for example, in 1408, where a dress line, the son, the son of the slacha, the son of the, 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 the slaughter of the shochet, appears in, in a rent roll in 1408, and Wiener Neustadt. So for these two towns, uh, where uh, actually Jewish uh, uh, slaughterers are documented, there are no prohibitions or regulations for the selling of meat by the Jews, neither in the city's town laws nor in the regulations of the respective butcher skills, despite them being uh, very detailed. I mentioned uh, before uh, that I will cover not only the legal uh, documents, but present uh, to you uh, a section about uh, an actual, well, Jewish question mark uh, craftsman. Uh, this section is, I have to say, a very tentative one uh, with a lot of maybes, could be's. And, and you would be very correct to, to tell me you know nothing at the end. Uh, in 1386, Archbishop Pilgrim of Salzburg took a gunsmith into his service. He was at that time in a continuous war with his Bavarian neighbors and thus had taken from the 1370s onwards a significant number of gunsmiths into his service. And in April 18, uh, 1386, Georg, the baptized Jew, enter his service at the Episcopal Court. Let's first have a closer look at the conditions a Georg had to work under. In regard to the contractual terms, there is no difference to contracts with other gunsmiths. In his reversal of the contract, Georg promised to serve his new lord in any way and at all places to where the archbishop would send me to the best of his abilities. He promised to make, remain resident in the Archbishop's territory and not to serve any other territorial lord or anyone else without the Archbishop's consent. For these services, he would receive an annual payment of 100 florins, quite a considerable sum actually. In addition to that, the food he, should he would receive on a daily basis from the Episcopal court is defined in detail, two types of bread, certain amounts of wine, and it is uh, explicitly stated that he and his family would get this regardless of whether the day was a holiday and whether he himself was present in the city or not, meaning that his wife and children would still get the food even if he was away. Just as it was custom for court servants is emphasized, his horses too would be cared for by the court. Until the contract was terminated, Georg should make his arts available to the archbishop and to anyone the archbishop names. And, and I find this particularly interesting, he should also teach his craft. What makes this contract interesting for us, apart from its details in general, is of course how Georg himself issues the charter. Ich, Georg, der getauft Jud Büchsenmeister. I, Georg, the baptized Jew gunsmith. 
the word Meister, Master, points to a craftsman who has already reached the highest step, so to say, in his career. The obtainment of the master title, which was usually only achieved by a small percentage of craftsmen, at least those working in regular guilds, it does, however, not necessarily apply to, to court uh, artisans. It raises a lot of questions, of course. The questions first, was Georg local or not? Generally, the questions from which geographic area the archbishop recruited his court artisans. It is under his rule out of necessity or necessity as much as out of his obvious interest for arms that actually led to an, you could say, installation of an organized armory. A new weapon was introduced. I just draw this, this, this picture because I think it's, it's amazing. <laughs> A new weapon was introduced, the, what is referred to as Steinbuchs, a gunpowder-fired cannon of, of, of stone missiles. And for this purpose, Pilgrim had already brought acknowledged and well-respected gunsmiths to his residential city. Jakob of Toran and particularly Walter of Arle, who had previously worked in Cologne, Frankfurt and Augsburg. And yes, I, I totally went down the, the rabbit hole of Salzburg gunsmith in the preparation. <laughs> of this paper. Apart, however, from these highly sought after experts, the archbishop also employed local artisans. Therefore, it is but a guess to place Georg among the more skilled and presumably not local craftsmen. Herbert Klein, the Salzburg historian Herbert Klein, in his unfortunately very short overview over the Salzburg gunsmiths, ranks him as the, I quote, most important after Walter of Arle and Jakob of Toran, but this does not give any further evidence to back up that statement. I do, however, think it is not entirely made up out of thin air. Georg the Baptist, too, as we remember, received an annual payment of a hundred florins, while Jakob, already acknowledged and famous, got only 70 pounds. And the service of the really lesser known Georg of Friedburg were worth a mere 20 pounds per year, while the other conditions of the contracts were similar to those of Georg. So he received really, really, really a lot of money. Georg's Jewishness, or at least past Jewishness, does seem to have been sort of irrelevant, yet noteworthy, if only possibly as a byname. While he himself refers to as the baptized Jews, Jew, the chancellery of the archbishop took an interesting shortcut. On the reverse side of Georg's contract, there is a note which was presumably wit written by the chancellery to more easily identify the respective documents and which appears on all the other contracts of gunsmiths and other court artisans as well. His note reads, Georgius Jude Puxenschütz, Georg the Jew gunsmith, or actually gunshot marksman, Puxenschütz. And I find it very, very interesting that they omit the baptized here. As a comparison, I brought you the, 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 the identification of the contract of, of Jakob of Toran, which just simply reads his name, Jakob, and then, and then uh, Büchsenschütz guns. Over the following two years, uh, Georg issued quittances to the archbishop's treasury about his salary, or at least part of it, in case of which he also noted the remaining sum he was still owed. In these quittances, over 150 and 60 florins respectively, respectively, he again refers to himself as getaufter Jude, Taufjud, baptized Jew, and as a bonus for Andreas, he also seals the documents with his own seal, and I'm really, really, really sorry about the poor quality of these images, or rather of the seals or the, the, the remnants thereof. This is really a best, the best I could do. But this is the seal of, of Georg, the baptized Jew, just, just for you. <laughs> the elephant in the room is, of course, when at what stage in his life did Georg learn his craft? Meaning also, of course, did he learn it as a Christian or as a Jew? 
And here we return to what I have warned you about, that I will do mere speculation. If we presume that he was already a somewhat acknowledged and skilled gunsmith when entering the Archbishop's service, and as the contract refers to him as a married man and having children, meaning at least two, I would guess, he must have been at least in his mid to late twenties, if not older, in 1386. Had he learned his craft already as a Christian after his baptism, then even if we apply this less strict regulation of artisans outside craft skills and do not overestimate the strictness of the guilds, his baptism must nevertheless have been have occurred still during his childhood, at least 10 more likely 15 or more years prior to his engagement at the Episcopal court. This, of course, poses the question, would he, ref would he still refer to himself as the baptized Jew after all these years when he has lived his entire adult life as a Christian? Their answer is yes, possibly. While new Christian Neuchrist Neophytus was one of, one of the common denominators in Austrian sources of, well, baptized Jews, the bynames getaufter Jude, Tauf Jude, as used by Georg, are equally common, however, more common among those who had been often forcibly baptized as adults, though perhaps more for a lack of source material that we can really properly answer that. The more tantalizing option, of course, is might he have learned his craft as a Jew and only after his education decided for whatever reason or under whatever pressure to opt for baptism, which also entails the question, did he marry before or after his baptism, meaning that is his wife, uh, was his wife a Christian woman or was his wife Jewish before? Alas, the source material, of course, deserts us completely in this regard. We do know about Jewish gunsmiths, but not much. I just want to point out uh, Markus Wenninger, who has written about uh, Jewish gunsmiths, uh, Moses of Mühlhausen in Thuringia, who had made a cannon for the city of Göttingen, albeit uh, uh, almost precisely 100 years later in 1486-87. In so it is, uh, what I'm trying to say is it, it's not entirely impossible, but yeah, no source material whatsoever. <laughs> what remains then is the question what uh, became of him and again, the frustrating lack of source material. There is a Georg Brüxenmeister who appears three times in 1391 without the byname baptized Jew and obviously about to leave or just having left the archbishop's service. In 1391, he confirms frequently that he has received all his outstanding salary, other dues, and would raise no further claims to the archbishop, which he has suggested as he has left court service or was about to leave court service. This is then evident from a third charter in which he promises that even if he went to work for another lord, once the archbishop or his successor would call him back, he would, I quote, write and come to his service immediately and without delay. It is very tempting, I have to uh, confess, to equate this Georg gunsmith with our baptized Jew, and even more tempting is it to equate him with the Georg Gunsmith of 1395, four years later, the citizen of Hallein, the second biggest city in the Archbishopric. If, if he is the same Georg, it seems that he dropped the byname baptized Jew, the denominator baptized Jew, once he left the archbishop's service and settled down in an urban environment. And I, I have to stress the huge, like huge font, uh, red uh, uh, painted if, uh, if it is uh, the same. I'm, I'm, I'm very tempted to do that because I probably can see it's the same writer, it's the same, the same scribe, but could be, of course, a court 
a court scribe who writes this this um yeah i'm running out of time which uh serves me uh which is which is good actually because the last topic the promised jewish guild i keep very very short since it actually leads us away from jewish craftsmanship and more into the territory of linguistics the history of guilds the perception of of jewish uh social entities namely the main term which i find still very interesting also in in in, in regard to to the history of, of of craftsmanship in general the main term that was used in austria for the jewish community which is the term zeche the same name, the same term that is used for craft guilds. While the term appears more often in reference to any financial administrative function, particularly the Zechmeister, the master of the Jewish guilds, uh, and therefore suggests a specific use to describe the, the Zedaka, both the, the Jewish guild, the Judenzeche, and the Judenzechmeister, the master of the Jewish guilds, also appear in a more, more general context in rent rolls and monasteries, for example. This is, of course, not, not Jewish craftsmanship. It is, however, what I like to, to introduce a bit in the broader can context of the history of guilds and the perception of Jewish organizations, a suggestion to think about, about craft guilds, Jewish communities as interest groups, and to think about, about the many similarities they share in terms of organization and function, the solutions they find and, and the influences that they, they, they share uh, mutually. In the end, again, uh, I hope I have uh, whetted your appetite for the Austrian source material, even if Jewish craftspeople do not appear as frequently in it as we would probably wish for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Birgit and Isaac, for your rich talks. And I think they show once again uh, which, with uh, which particular problems the sources, especially for Ashkenaz, uh, leave us in um, interpreting these uh, different terminologies, uh, the terms used, and um, the little hidden hidden things. Uh, um, restrictions and so on, and uh, what are we actually going to do with it? Um, I will start with those things I see here in the chat, and the first thing I see is by came by uh, Eva Freumovic. Uh, she asks if this document um, speaking about uh, among the Jews and the Christians, if here the German means unter, and if I saw right, it's unter the Christians unter and uh, unter unter Jews and unter unter the the Christians, right? About, uh, in in both cases, it's among. So you want to say something about this, Birgit? Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to translate this unter den Juden. It can refer from from just a description of the of the Jewish quarter, the Jewish lane, to to. Uh, yeah, in 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 the Jewish uh, context, or 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 yeah, I I came up with a mom because it's 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 equally it's equally wake as the German the German unter is. So within the Jew, no, within the Jews is not good. <laughs> okay, um, the next question I see is. Uh, for Birgit again, are there regulations how to mark the place or the seller when selling unkosher meat from Jewish butchers to Christians? Sorry, Sorry I, I didn't quite catch that. Again, are there regulations how to mark the place or the seller when selling unkosher meat from Jewish butchers to Christians? There is there is a, a one uh, it's it's uh, for Salzburg I think yes it's for Salzburg where uh, the the Jewish meat uh, has to be sold at the at the very fringe of the market and it has to be put on on stools beside the table 
So on the table is the is the 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 meat of of uh, injured animals, sick animals, trichinous meat, and uh, there have to be there, there there should be or at least the regulations say so. Uh, there should be uh, uh, stools beside the table, and on these stools there should be the 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 uh, Jewish meat. There is another another regulation uh, for the southern Tyrolia, but I have not I have not looked I have not been able to to look into that because we cannot find the manuscript in the archive um, that says that uh, the meat shall shall be so, sold again at the um, at the uh, uh, Fleischbank, so at the municipal Fleischbank. And that uh, the the seller there, who is uh, um, an official of the of the uh, municipal Fleischbank, shall alert every customer, every Christian customer who wants to buy the the Jewish meat. So these are the. Oh, I, I think there is a there is a, a, a regulation from what you're probably referring to from Augs. Uh, with uh, with uh, with a Jewish hat um, that the seller uh, that the Jews who are selling uh, their meat at the at the municipal market should wear the Jewish hat. We don't have that kind of that kind of regulation in in, in Austria. And as I said, many many of the of the of these regulations are in 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 towns or very small towns which don't have any Jewish population ever. Kitzbühel in Tyrol, which has barely any Christian population in the Middle Ages. So <laughs> there's just no, no um, actual uh, uh, translation, so to say, into, into reality. And it, it is interesting that the, that the, the, the towns with the, with the huge Jewish communities don't have these regulations. So I would really, really, really be very much questioning the 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 well could you say actualness of these or the reality of these of these regulations that of course they of course uh, tie in with with all the with all the um, uh, ecclesiastical warnings about about Jewish meat and Jewish poison and blah blah whatever but uh, really for for Jewish butchers hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. And next, a question for Isaac by Eva Freimovic. Uh, if Rabino Tam paved the way for Jewish parchment years, what does that tell us about possible changes in the status of this craft? And she adds, smelly or holy? <laughs> there is very little evidence. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Uh, there is very little evidence. We see that he himself made parchment. We see later on that his school, uh, students of Rabbein Utam and students of students of Rabbein Utam insist, and we can assume that they use Jewish parchment. Um, there is one thing I didn't mention throughout my, my presentation, that um, there was another way to bypass the ruling of Rabbein Utam was to go to, this, to the um, workshop of this uh, non-Jewish parchment makers and to participate with their work. So we see that they, they, they battled with the, this difficulty. And we find this uh, very interesting uh, uh, case of uh, Sarit Shalev Eni from uh, uh, um, that, that, that a Jew wanted to participate or to take part of the, of the guild. So we see that, that some change was made. How much, we don't know. Um, uh, I think that there is a lot to study. I, I try to, in in the um, uh, halachic um, uh, material, I try to uncover every stone that I found. I mean, I I'll be very surprised to see that there is something I didn't find uh, uh, so far. But who knows? I, I'm waiting for much more research in archives. Could I just follow this up, sorry, so that you don't have to read my comments. So um, if if I remember correctly, the, 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 the I think it was from, yeah. Um, I, I remember you showing us a source where Rabbi Tam actually, Rabbeinu Tam actually lets his boys do something. Uh, you know, is it possible that making 
means something like making under my supervision or ordering to be made under my supervision or something like that, but without Rabbeinu Tam actually getting his hands completely dirty? Definitely, yes, but uh, I doubt it. If We don't know who were these boys. When he mentions my, my I don't know if these boys were like the, Eng the English boys in South Africa, uh, meaning not meaning uh, you know so that South African natives or is it is it Jewish boys? I have no idea. What is it? Naarim. Naarim, yes. Mm. So, yeah, Abraham's Naarim come to mind. Who knows? I, I assume that they were Jewish because the he's not the one that claims that just helping is sufficient. But who knows? I, I, I think the question should be open. I think that your, your remark is extremely important. Okay, thank you. We continue the ping pong and go back to Birgit. A question for her. Can we assume that there is a traineeship in gun making given the early date? Are these people self-taught persons comparable to uh, perhaps uh, early hydraulic engineers? Oh, <laughs> a very, very difficult question. I, I do think there is training. I, has, I have no idea about my, my example about Georg because we know next to nothing about him. Uh, there is, I could not, unfortunately, I did not get the book in time because libraries are closed. There is a, a, a work of, of Knut Schulz uh, about, about Walter von Ahle uh, and his training first in 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 trier then in then in i think in 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 cologne and uh, uh then in in frankfurt where he where he uh, makes his first gun which explodes and and uh <laughs> which is a very huge scandal because the gun explodes and the and the citizens are like we paid so much money for that shit and uh which he then blames on his poor training and on his poor education so uh it's 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 very very difficult to to say whether we can really really say it's a it's a learned craft there is of course the craft of the of the of the Büchsenmeister, the the municipal the craft of the Büchsenmeister, which is in in at least in Salzburg is part of the of the goldsmith craft uh, of the goldsmith guild actually but which of course are not the, are not the 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 engineers uh, who make these these really 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 huge huge guns and in many, in many, what I've what I've found uh, in reference to the the Christian gunsmith that many of them are uh, at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century, are also uh, you could say modern in, in modern terms members of the military, that they are not that much uh, of uh, artisans or crafts. Uh, people as we probably define it in the urban in an urban context uh, but members of the of the respective courts where they serve uh, in multiple functions one of them being being uh, often head of the artillery so uh, members of the of the of the military who at the same time uh, uh, construct these cannons and and work these cannons, use these cannons. Go go. Uh, we have the example of of when far away from the Jews now. <laughs> we have the example of, of Walter von Ahle, uh, which is very very fascinating rabbit hole, as I said, uh, because he switches sides during the the Salzburg Bavarian War and goes to work for the for the Duke of Bavaria. And is then present at the at the sieges where he works the cannon. So he, they do not only build, uh, construct them, and and oversee the, the 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 construction, but they actually they actually go to war with them. So I think it's a very very interesting, very difficult uh, uh, question. I would I, I'm I'm very much looking forward to reading uh, Knut Schulz's uh, work on on Walter von Ahle because he 
what I could glimpse from what I found on Google Books uh, that he especially deals with with a topic is how the training, how the, the education of these these early uh, early gunsmiths really work because it is at this time it is a new it is a new craft you could say this this huge this huge cannons is a, is a new craft in the in the well mid uh, 14th century and whether whether Jews are are are, are part of this. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps Georg is part of it when he's still Jewish. Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, Simcha Golin from the Goldstein Goren Diaspora Research Center in Tel Aviv University. Uh, I welcome you to the sixth session in our uh, workshop, Jewish Craftspeople in the Middle Ages. Actually, we started the idea two years ago or more in Leeds, and uh, now we are doing it according to this, uh, our um, position in the in this flag but um, uh, I'm until now it was very good to hear all of you from all over the world and I want to start this uh, sixth session archaeological perspective the city of Cologne we, uh, actually we are talking about the relationship of the or between the archaeological perspective and the question of uh, craftspeople, Jewish craftspeople in the Middle Ages in the city of Cologne. We have two speakers that are talking about the same uh, subject and we will have the, um, the question after the two uh, lectures. The first lecture is Tanya Utov. She is uh, talking about the Jewish craftspeople in medieval Cologne, places in the written sources. Uh, Tanya studied prehistoric and early historic uh, archaeology, Christian uh, archaeology, and European culture anthropology in Bonn and Munich, Germany. In 2007, she graduated in Munich, doctoral thesis on the archaeology and the uh, arche Archaeology or uh, history of the of uh, Gutsburg, a medieval episcopal castle near Cologne. Since 2050, she has uh, been curator of the archaeological of the Middle Ages and modern age in the uh, Mikva uh, Jewish Museum in the archaeological quarter in Cologne. Uh, currently, she is part of the team planning the Future Museum and its uh, permanent exhibition in Cologne. And we are, everybody is uh, waiting to, to, hear, to hear about the, um, the archaeological findings in uh, Cologne, in this uh, very interesting place. And the, the first lecture will be traces in the written sources, please. Okay, I'll start um, sharing my screen. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, I think it was in 2018 when Maria Stürzebecher and Andreas Lennart suggested that we should occupy ourselves with uh, the Jewish craftspeople in Cologne. And I think it was, we set to work and it was worthwhile. And today, uh, thank you very much um, for having the opportunity to share our results with you. Um, and welcome to our uh, shared session on medieval Jewish craftspeople in Cologne. I will introduce uh, to you the topography of the medieval of medieval Cologne, and I will try to uh, trace any indications uh, on Jewish craftspeople in the written sources. And Michael will then later on present uh, the archaeological sources uh, within the Jewish quarter that are relating the same topic. 
together. I hope um, that we will achieve a clearer picture of Jewish craftspeople in Cologne. One of the most important sources on medieval Jewish craft in Cologne um, are this, is the so-called Judenschreinsbuch. Uh, the Schreinsbücher are some kind of cadastral register. Uh, they came into existence around 1135 and are therefore the oldest record of the kind uh, in medieval uh, Germany or former, yeah, or what is today Germany. Um, the Jewish quarter has it, had its own register, the so-called Judenschreinsbuch. Fortunately, it also contains, uh, yeah, it contains a lot of details about the Jewish quarter and its houses. And I have tried to search it now for any indications on craftspeople or workshops. It is not always possible, though, to distinguish, uh, to distinguish clearly between professional and domestic crafts and also between craft and trade. Um, so the same methodological problem appears, uh, occurs to the archaeological sources. And therefore, we have uh, decided to, um, to take a wider perspective on the topic. But let us start on the general topography. So the city is situated on the River Rhine in the west of Germany. So we're zooming into the city. Um, here's uh, Cologne Cathedral. And here about 300 meters from it um, is uh, the Town Hall Square. And on this same spot, the new Jewish Museum of Cologne uh, yeah, is coming into existence right now. Um, so we are located right in the city center in front of the town hall. For us, of course, uh, the medieval topography is of more interest. Um, this is a map of 16th century Cologne, which gives us a good impression on the medieval situation as well. The blue line marks, uh, uh, here, marks uh, the Roman city wall. Uh, which is uh, the oldest part of the town, and uh, the red color highlights here uh, the Jewish quarter. The Jewish community lived here on this spot from the beginning of the 11th century, and in 1424 uh, they had to leave when the Jews were expelled from Cologne. So for about 400 years this was the site of the Jewish quarter. As you can see, it's uh, in the center of the city, about 300 meters from the Cologne Cathedral. Therefore, the Jewish quarter is no isolated part of the city. It is therefore quite helpful to take a look at its neighborhood. It is situated near the cathedral and the palace of the archbishop. So it's here in blue. Um, and um, there is clearly a strong legal connection between the Jewish community and the archbishop because he is the owner of the so-called Judenregal. Right uh, to the east of the Jewish quarter, on the way to, to the River Rhine, uh, we find the two main markets of Cologne. Oh, it's here and here. It's um, the Altermarkt, the Old Market, and the Heumarkt, the Haymarket. And uh, so this means we are very close to the, um, to the commercial center as well. And there's there are nearly direct access to it. So this is also probably the reason why in the 12th century, the town hall was built right in the center of the Judengasse, a fact that is quite remarkable because the Jewish quarter is older. Um, so another important neighbor of the Jewish community, well, the goldsmith here, yeah, marked in yellow um, or gold. And uh, so the vicinity is to the west. I will um, say more about them later on. But now I would like to zoom into the Jewish quarter itself. So this is a virtual reconstruction of the Jewish quarter before 1349 when the yeah, before the plague program. Um, this reconstruction is the result of a cooperation between the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt, the archeologist of the city of Cologne and, uh, and Mikva. 
and um, so we hope you might get an impression of what the quarter might have looked at uh, like in the Middle Ages. Um, in the southern part of the Jewish quarter, you do find the Schulhof, the synagogues, uh, synagogues yard, with um, all the other community buildings like the mikve, a, a bath, a, a warm bath, a bakery, the hospital, and so on. Uh, right along the Judengasse, which is this street here, and in the north, we uh, do find most of the private houses, yards, and workshops, probably. <clears throat> From the oath book of the city, we can learn that the Judengasse was a passageway for wagons. I do mention this because I think uh, yeah, the infrastructure of transport is quite important uh, yeah, for crafts and, uh, and trade as well. So um, it's it quite, uh, yeah, I, I really like it because it, uh, yeah, the source mentions some sort of a one-way passage because um, on, on the entrance no, on this side here, the loaded wagon, uh, wagons enter the, um, the quarter and here on this other side, they leave uh, through the unloaded wagons leave through another, um, yeah, um, another porch. Yeah. So to give you an impression of the actual quality of the road, uh, infrastructure, um, take a look at those two pictures of the excavation. So this is um, one of the basements of a house right next uh, to the Judengasse. And um, this is here is some of the, the street pavement. Also this, uh, this little um, piece of road surface over here. And what you can see here is the pavement of pebbles dating before 1349. So this does not seem very impressive, but since it is the street in front of the town hall, we can suppose that it is not below the standard of the rest of medieval Cologne. So it must have been quite fun in a rainy Cologne winter, I think. So we have already seen the Goldsmith Quarter um, that is situated right next to the Jewish quarter. And here you can see that it is really rather floating around it. Um, here's uh, the modern street Unter Goldschmied. It's the literal translation of the Latin Inter Auriefabris. So under Goldsmith, so we have the same term than Birgit Wiedel before. Um, so unlike uh, the Jewish quarter that was a legal descript, a district with fixed boundaries, the Goldsmith Quarter has a quite different character because it was um, yeah, nothing more than a social and commercial agglomeration of artisans of the same craft. So many of them lived in the streets marked, uh, marked orange here, but they also spread all around the city. And um, yeah, this green circle here uh, marks uh, the guild hall of the goldsmith, uh, this house zum goldenen horn, which was uh, founded in 1401. And as you can see later on, the connection between the Jewish quarter and the goldsmith quarter is even closer than this picture implies. Indeed, uh, they're interlinked very intimately. Um, Cologne is known as a production center uh, for high quality gold objects since the 12th century. Since that time, we can also trace a significant number of goldsmiths um, yeah, around the Jewish quarter. Um, a special feature of Cologne project uh, are high quality animal works. Um, so animals, uh, animal like glass animal and not, <laughs> not the creatures. Um, so uh, this is an example from the cathedral treasure. I show this because we also have finds from the excavation. Um, they do look a bit run down, actually, because they have not been preserved in a cathedral treasury, but they have suffered fire destruction from the pogrom uh, of 1349 and were buried in the ground for more than 600 years. So most of, uh, of the glass inlays are gone. So later, 
uh, later on, Michael will show you one object which was only semi finished. So um, a clear indication to a goldsmith workshop. So you can see those products were produced here as well and not only um, yeah, existent. The statutes of the Cologne goldsmiths are dating to the 14th century AD, um, and they contain an interesting paragraph, which I will translate into English. It says, we also have determined that no brother shall burn gold for a Jew, nor hammer it, layer it, enamel it, nor polish gold or silver, nor appraise it, nor work in a Jew's house, as far as our guild is concerned. Whoever does so, will have to pay a fine. At the first glance, this passage, of course, could be interpre uh, interpreted as an anti-Jewish statement. At the second glance, it seems a bit weird, though, um, because no other guild order contains a similar passage. And why should the goldsmith diminish their profits by working for Jews? So perhaps one can interpret it, this passage in a different manner. So could it indicate that there were Jewish goldsmiths? Um, so, and maybe it was an instrument to stake off different markets. So in that case, the Christian goldsmith would not work for Jews to leave business to their Jewish colleagues and vice versa. Next step for me was to search for goldsmiths within the Ju Judenschein's book. Unfortunately, I only found Christian ones, but this shows nonetheless that the area was interesting for a goldsmith, I think. Mm. The fact that the houses were owned by the goldsmith do not necessarily mean that there were work workshops. It is also possible that they bought and so, uh, that they were bought and sold for speculative reasons. So this might be the case uh, with Johannes Pulmona. Um, he is yeah, his house is over here because he owned. He was only one of three parties owning the house. And it is certainly the case uh, with Gerhard Lange, who bought um, three, um, um, three real estate um, yeah, sites uh, after the pogrom of 1349. Um, and we know Ger Gerhard Lange quite very well. He lived over here. And uh, we know that he bought houses on, and sold them for speculative reasons. So he was probably one of, um, yeah, one of the people taking profit from the pogrom. So not in Judenschrein's book, but in one of the other cadastral registers, we find a goldsmith with a quite interesting name. It is uh, Moses Aurifaber, and he lived in the Schildergasse, that is way outside the Jewish quarter. It's over here, it's one of the two main shopping streets today. Um, but who is this Moses Aurifaber? Is he a Jew living apart from the others? Is he a convert? Or maybe just a Christian with an unusual name? So actually, we really don't know. About, three, about 100 years later, the register list a Josef Johann Moses Goldsläger, prob probably a descendant of the older Moses. Um, at that time, no Jews were allowed to live in the city anymore. So they were banned uh, in 1424. So this man was probably Christian. So there's still a good chance that Moses also, uh, the, the earlier Moses also was, but still there remains his um, yeah, quite unusual name. So apart from the Judensteins book, we have also other sources uh, giving evidence to Jewish craftsmen. So in 1326, the Archbishop of, of Cologne, Heinrich von Firneburg, de, uh, Firneburg, decreed that all regulations against the Jewish bakers, brewers, butchers, and poultry mer merchants had been annulled. So this informs us as about three different uh, professions having to do with the production of food, the bakers, the brewers, and the butchers. Concerning the butchers, it is known that they have operated uh, 
meat banks on the hay market outside the Jewish quarter for some time uh, in 1372. A new um, butcher's hall was erected at the hay market, and until 1400, uh, the Jewish uh, butchers operated their meat banks there as well, alongside uh, their Christian colleagues. Afterwards, they lost their right there. In the cesspits of the Jewish quarter, a great number of animal bones were found, and they uh, were specified by Hubert Berke from the University of Cologne. So, um, and um, yeah, there are another indications to Jewish butchers because uh, their composition is the result of a kosher or mainly kosher diet. Apart from the kosher animals uh, slaughtered, Berke found out that certain parts of the animals were preferred, so mostly the front parts. Um, in the cesspits of the Jewish houses, the number of bones of non-kosher animals is considerably lower than in Christian households. So this chart has been together by Michael, thank you very much. And uh, he has also put in to uh, Christian uh, cesspits for comparison. So these are the Christian ones, and these are the definitely Jewish cesspits. And you can see, so there is a really um, low percentage of non-kosher animals. Back to indications on crafts in the Judenschreinsbuch. At least four bakeries or baking houses can be traced. It is not possible, though, to distinguish between a baker's workshop or a small private or communal baking house used on a non-profit base. So the latter is quite common, is a quite common occurrence in the Rhineland area. At least uh, this baking house here in the western corner of the synagogue's yard can be identified as a communal institution. It is uh, called Pistrinum Judeorum. In the case of the brewery of the backyard of one of the houses here, it's the Brewhaus, um, it cannot be decided whether it is a private or commercial building too. But nonetheless, it is there. What we can trace though are two pharmacists uh, living on the Judengasse in the 13th and 14th century. So one, one is here, it's uh, in the Domus Apothecarii, and here it is, um, yeah, here we all also have a name of Alemus. A trade shop can be located on the corner of the Judengasse to Oben Maasport, a house called Nusia. Um, in medieval Cologne, the term uh, Gardemen, so it's here the Gardemen, um, or Gardemen usually, usually refer to wooden constructions on the front side of houses uh, containing small shops. From the description in the Schreinsbuch, we know that the mansion shop had a basement and three windows out to the street. Unfortunately, we do not get any hints as to the character of, um, of trade and the wares that were sold in there. Mm. On the other hand, we have a garn house in one of the Schrein, uh, Schreinsbuch entries after 1349. It, unfortunately, it is nearly impossible to locate the garn house according to the rather cryptic description. So I cannot make it out whether it is in the backyard or in, in the neighboring houses somewhere in this area because um, yeah, the Schrein's book mentions a lot of yards next to other yards, next to other yards again. And um, yeah, and it's quite complicated. And uh, I have a price set for anyone who can help me to locate uh, the Garn who's, um, and uh, I will um, yeah, spend him a bottle of wine. <laughs> so please feel free to, um, <laughs> to try and uh, locate it. Um, since I cannot actually yeah, locate it, it very, um, yeah, it, it might even be uh, identical with the shop we have um, had mentioned before here on this corner, but I really don't know. Um, usually the term garnhus or garnhaus 
is uh, the term for a storehouse of yarns that are transported to a city and have to be stored there for some time. Uh, but this does not really make sense in this case because we are neither um, yeah, in the port nor are we um, on the main street. So maybe it is just a shop or maybe it's, if it is in the backyard, it might also be a production site for yarn. I, I really don't know. Um, when I first found those two houses with the names Haus zum Blasebalg und Haus zur Sudpfanne, I was quite thrilled because I thought they might be indications of a smithy and a brewery. So a Blasebalg may be translated with a bellows that are used in a smithy, and a Sudpfanne is a big cauldron that is used by brewers. On the second look, I found out though that the name derived from their owners. So uh, Johannes von den Blasebalge and Petrus Generus Domine de Sudfen. So, which was quite um, yeah, a pity, but um, so, but it also shows that the names of houses are no reliable source to us, really. Mm. In addition to uh, written sources, we have two groups of objects with Hebrew writings or inscriptions. Those are books and gravestones. Um, they are yeah, their indication of Jewish craftspeople as well. We've already heard about Jewish book produ production yesterday. Um, so, and um, we have at least two medieval Hebrew manuscripts that have been produced in, or at least for Cologne. Uh, that have been pre uh, preserved, one, uh, the so-called Amsterdam Mazor and the Sefer Nikot um, Katan uh, that was copied by Hannah, the daughter of Menachem Ben Sion. Um, together with this, um, the find, um, together with the find of a book binding tool Michael will present us, um, they indicate the production of books within the Jewish quarter as well. The other group of objects in relation to Jewish craftsmen in Cologne are the medieval tombstones. Some of them have su survived in secondary uses in the town hall and, uh, and in Episcopal castles. Uh, they have been brought there after the pogrom of 1349. Um, these Hebrew inscriptions were made by stonemasons who knew what they were doing. So that is probably another reference to Jewish craftsmen in Cologne as well. So nearly coming to an end, I would like to make a small synthesis uh, of, in form of a list. So as far as we can trace in the historical and archeological sources, there is a number of different trades performed by Jewish craftspeople in Cologne so far. Maybe we will find some more in future. So we have bakers, we have butchers, brewers, goldsmiths, pharmacists, scribes, bookbinders from the archeological sources, stone masons, and what we also have is the manufacturing of bones, Michael will present later on. So I have also uh, tried to map all the mentions in the Judenschein's book that can be located. So, and what this map, map shows is that craft uh, does not seem to have been limited to certain areas within the Jewish quarter, but can be found all over the place. So they have been many and they have been everywhere. So, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, Tanya, it was very interesting and professional. We're looking for, uh, and we are, now going to, to hear Michael Weinen, uh, the, same, the same town of Cologne, uh, Jewish craftspeople in medieval Cologne about the archeological evidence. Uh, Michael Weinen has a master degree in the study of prehistoric archeology span and early history, medieval and modern ecclesiastical studies and Christian archeology span from Bonn. And uh, since 2009, he has been an uh, integral part of the archaeological zone and work in the um, excavation in the uh, in Cologne 
and is now connecting to the Jewish Museum project in Cologne. So please take the stand and we all want to hear you. Thank you. I will start to share my screen and start the presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Simar Goldin and Andreas Lenartz for the invitation to give a lecture at this workshop. After the presentation of the written sources by Tanya, I would now like to talk about the archaeological findings on crafts and their allocation in the quarter. As already mentioned in the previous lecture, the division between craft, trade, and domestic work is not always clear, even in the field of archaeological finds. Therefore, the current classification is to be understood as a first definition. In the beginning, I would like to briefly discuss the history of the excavations in Cologne. In 1953, in the course of the re reconstruction work after World War II, the archaeologist Otto Doppelfeld examined the area of the Roman Praetorium. It's about here. Only three years later, the area of the synagogue with the mikve was also excavated by Doppelfeld. In contrast to the Praetorium, the area of the synagogue was backfilled and used as a plaza till 2007. Since this year, the current works for the construction of the Mikva Museum are in progress. In this museum, the two areas of the Jewish quarter, quarter in the south are connected with the old area of the Praetorium in the north. In total, the medieval Jewish quarter covers an area of 12,000 square meters of which about 6,000 have been archaeologically examined in the past. In the area of the Roman Praetorium, how any meaningful remains of the Middle Ages have been preserved. Since 2007, about 2,500 square meters have been extensively archaeologically excavated in the south of the quarter. Thus, Approximately 20% of the medieval Jewish quarter have been well investigated. So far, 57 basements of Jewish community buildings and private buildings could be uncovered. You can see here the basement plan before 1349, the synagogue with the women's synagogue in the center. The mikve is direct south of the synagogue, the town hall, is at the east side of the quarter, Tanya showed it. In this overview, the sectors of craft and trade and domestic work are listed with the corresponding archeological find groups. The sector craft and trade was assigned the find groups, production waste, semi-finished products, casting molds, crucibles, tools and scrap material. The area of domestic work includes the fine groups tabs, mortars, milestones and grindstones, spindle walls and the loom white. A large part of the fines comes from the destruction layers from the plug pogrom in 1349. After the pogrom, any open pits, depressions, and basements were partly filled with the destruction layer very quickly. For example, example in front of the area of the town hall. Here you can see this area. The destruction layer contains the objects that were present in the houses at the time they were destroyed and survived the fires and plundering. Since the area 
of the square in front of the entrance to the town hall has not been rebuilt until today. The state of preservation of the archaeological finds in this area is particularly high. Let's again hear this area. Some of the destruction layer was spread over long distances. For example, furniture and fittings from the synagogue, such as the Bima, were found 60 meters away in a basement of a Jewish house over here. In the photos, you can see the destruction layer in situ with all the things inside. The first group of findings I would like to present is production waste. Here, the remains of beet production for rosaries. So far, nine fragments of bones have been found. The fine spots extend over a large area within the quarter. No concentration can be determined, but all fine spots are located in the middle of the Jewish quarter. A very similar picture can be seen in the distribution of the semi-finished products. Here, primarily those of the production of bone dyes. The fine spots are also widely scattered over the quarter, but these are also in the area in front of the town hall and in the southern area. One fragment comes from a filling in the basement of a house of a Christian goldsmith over here in the south. The silver plate, Tanya mentioned it, on the upper left clearly shows damage from the fire during the program 1349. Under special lightning, two people are visible under a tree, a woman on the left and a man on the right sitting under a tree a typical courtly scene. However, no remains of enamel inlays are found, suggesting that they had no yet been applied. This information comes from the restorer Hendrik Strelo, who examined the piece during the restoration. Thank you for this, Hendrik. Due to the small number, there are no clear concentrations in the distribution of the finds. And direct evidence of goldsmiths is given through the findings of casting molds. There are those made of limestone, but also some others made from cattle bones. These cattles of sepia were found both in the southern area within the Christian goldsmiths here, but also in the very north here. The fine spots within the synagogue are confusing at first glance, but easily resolved. Under the women's synagogue is a deep pit filled with the destruction layer from the program 1349. In addition to furnishings from the synagogue, such as the Bima, there are also items that came from surrounding houses to the north, I think here. The two molds in the west of the synagogue date from after 1372, when the synagogue was rebuilt in a reduced size after the resettlement. The new synagogue was smaller and did not include the area in the west. Here, a house was built. Its caspit was dug between the east wall of the house and the west wall of the new synagogue. According to the animal bones found together with the molds, both are the remains of a Jewish household. With some certainty, crucibles in which the precious metal was molten can also be attributed to goldsmiths. Their distribution shows that these extend far across the entire Jewish quarter far beyond the area of the Christian goldsmiths. 
The image on the lower right is from Otto Doppelfeld's original documentation from the 1950s. Although no emphasis was placed on the medieval building remains, he recorded a large number of the finds in his diary, so that at least some of the old finds, even if they were not picked up, are available for our evaluation. The find of scales, balance whites, and a stone for checking the gold content of objects may also be belong to the area of trade. The folding tool for parchment on the lower left belongs to a bookmaker, thus again into the area of craft. Particularly exciting is the fragment of the scale on the upper left, which, according to Tanya Potov, measures only very small whites due to its construction, only three to five gram. Here, possibly a pharmacy is to be thought of. The location where this, this scale was found is a little bit problematic. It comes from a pit below the synagogue wall. You can see it here. So it is older than the synagogue from the early 11th century. The gold testing stone as well as the balance whites can be used in the craft in the area of the goldsmiths as well as in trade. The distribution again extends again over large areas of the Jewish quarter. In historical images, these tools are quasi identifiable in use. In the left, a view the sale of the goldsmith Petrus Christus with a scale in his hand while it's lie on the table next to it. In the right picture is clearly visible the crucible during heating. Another group of finds that can be used to obtain information about trade are inscripted slate plates. During the excavation, almost 500 slates with graffiti have been found so far. Two of them will be presented here in more detail. These panels are currently being studied in the project Medieval Slate Panels from Cologne at the Goethe University Frankfurt am Main under the direction of Professor Dr. Elisabeth Hollander. The two slate plates were found in the center of the chamber. The inscription on the upper plate indicates meat trade because of the large sums of money and measure measuring units involved. In the lower plate, the connection with the meat trade can be assumed. Part meat such as leg or foot and names are combined. At that point, big thanks to Elisabeth Hollander, Marlin Dres and Max Hohlfelder for sharing their results with us. So we have a direct connection between the meat house outside the quarter and the findings and possible meat trade inside the Jewish quarter. One very special find can also be considered as an indication of goldsmith's craft. This gold earring, which can be dated to the first half of the 11th century, was found in a rubbish pit that was used until the 15th century. This is also evidenced by coins dated up to the 15th century that were also found in the same backfill. This golden earring was found in a completely crushed state and already had parts missing. This is the finding in situ. After incorrect unfolding without any documentation, various repairs were visible. Obviously, this piece of jewelry was no longer in use and was in a workshop of a craftsman to be melted down. How and when exactly the object got into the rubbish pit can no longer be determined. The overall mapping of all fine spots on the subject of crafts and trade shows a broad distribution of finds almost over the entire area of the excavation. However, there are cluster points in the area next to the synagogue, in the courtyard area of the houses in the Judengasse, and in the northern town hall square. 
However, these cannot be connected with specific workshops. After the presentation of the finds to the craft and trade, I'd like to present the following, the finds connected to domestic work. Here you can see tabs, which may well occur in private houses. The few fine points scatter so far that no statement can be made. Another group of fines attributed to the private household are the mortars. These certainly belong to the private household, but may also have been used secondary a kiln. The type of use can only be determined by traces of use, since all the traces of use found so far can rather be attributed to the exposure to fire in the program of 3049. The use as a mortar is preferred. Moreover, these mortars are multifunctional. In addition to preferring food, they can be used to grind paint as a stove filled with coal to heat rooms, to burn fragment herbs, to prepare medicines. A variety of uses come into consideration. Since these mortars have found in almost every household, the distribution of fines over large parts of the quarter is not surprising. Just like the mortars, the hand mill as well as the milestone and the grindstone belong rather to the area of domestic work due to their small size. As with the mortars, the distribution of fines is widely scattered and does not, not result in a concentration. Oh, sorry. A very common group of findings are spinning worlds. These were often used in a private household for spinning yarn. It's not surprising that they were found almost in the entire Jewish quarter, but also in the area of the Christian goldsmith houses. Spinning was usually was a domestic craft, although we have to mention that Cologne was also a production center for gold spinning and an own guild for this trade. The individual loom white does not allow any further conclusions. The use of the hand mill as well as the spinning mill can be seen in these two illustrations. The mapping of all finds related to the thematic area of domestic work in contrast to craft trade does not show any conspicuous concentrations, but it's broadly distributed over the entire area of the Jewish quarter and the basements of the Christian houses in the south. If we now place all the fine spots in one table, we get this uniform picture. Almost everywhere in the medieval Jewish quarter, there's an archeological evidence of crafts, trade, and work in the private sector. The empty areas along Engasse, which leads up to the town hall and Unter Goldschmied, are primarily due to bad preservation conditions cause of the deep modern cellars. In the northern area, this picture is not so clear due to the few documented finds. Nevertheless, there are some finds from the area of craft, trade, and domestic work, which do not contradict the picture in the rest of the area, but complement it. If we now map the craftsmen identified by Tanya in the written sources, it becomes apparent that they do not directly correspond to the fine sites. The two goldsmiths are documented, documented in the area of the town hall, but it's rather unlikely that the goldsmith's finds in this area can be linked to these two craftsmen, as one of them was only active there after the, after the pogrom of 3049. After this first step, the combination of the written sources and the archaeological sources for their work can now follow. To recall once again the slide of the craftsmen proven in written sources, here is a slide from the previous lecture. Of the eight crafts mentioned in the written sources, four have been variably documented by archaeological finds. These are the butchers, the goldsmiths, the scribes, and the bookbinders. Manufacturing of bones is documented exclusively by archaeological finds. If one does not draw the line quite so tightly, 
then the bakers can be also considered to be documented by the mills and the brewers by the taps. Thus, seven different crafts can be considered proven within the Jewish quarter. Archaeological evidence of crafts is very frequent in the Cologne city area. I would like to conclude with two excavations near the Jewish quarter, one to the south here and one next to the cathedral. The Heumarkt, the Heimarkt, is a large market area that is still preserved as a square today. It is located in the immediate neighborhood of the Jewish quarter. Extensive excavations have taken place, but they have yielded comparatively few finds relating to crafts. The marketplace was used from the 10th to the 17th century. Six different overlying market areas could be proven. The finds relating to crafts and trade are not very extensive, but bone carving was practiced as in the Jewish quarter, and that scales are found in a market area is not very surprising. A second workshop is located very close to the cathedral. Here, the remains of a rock crystal workshop were excavated, which contains six, 65,000 crystal fragments and three iron hammers. The workshop is a unique testimony to hardstone cutting in Cologne. The Jewish quarter, with its evidence of, hand, of crafts and trade and domestic work, it's also integrated into the city of Cologne as an important component in this respect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, both of you. Very interesting and uh, intriguing uh, lectures. And uh, actually, you, you take the challenge to combine the archaeological uh, and the written sources and I very interesting and I opened the, the screen to questions we have uh, two uh, questions um, the first one is from Israel Sandman as halachic responsible literature in Hebrew been examined did you find any any halachic sources in Hebrew? Unfortunately, uh, neither oh. Michael nor me uh, do speak Hebrew, so so we couldn't um, yeah examine those sources. Um, but uh, currently, there's a project by by Effie uh, Schwarm Steiner um, yes. about the Hebrew source, sources to Cologne, and I hope sometime in in the near future we may connect <coughs> our um, yeah, uh, um, how do you say our results? Yeah. Thank you. The, the second question is from uh, Balzen. I know Balzen. Can you can you put him in the screen and to that he can ask directly, and we will feel more like a workshop, not as a virtual. Uh... Still existing. And uh, yeah. thank you, Simcha. Uh, well, I was asking, uh, do you have any chronology according, uh, concerning your findings? Um, this is um, for, for Michael. Um, uh, so to say, uh, in which findings are belonging to which centuries? This was my first question. I have also a small one to Tanya. Um, as I said, most of the findings dated before uh, the pogrom um, 1349. Some of them are... Uh, little bit older. Older mean 13th century or 12th century? 12th, 12th century and some of them maybe are 11th century. We have uh, some old parts in the in the houses in in front of the program 1349. Mm -hmm. Yeah and when I'm already thank you Michael and Tanya you, you spoke of a gran house, and maybe you explained it by maybe I missed it. What is a gran house? Uh, garen house. A garen house, sorry. Garen yeah. Jan, Jan house, yeah, in uh, translation, yeah. It's probably um, uh, 
a house where yarn was sold. According to the Frühhoch uh, Deutsches Wörterbuch, a yarn house is a storehouse for yarn uh, that is uh, transported through a city. But um, I think, uh, yeah, the location does not fit to that translation. Yeah. And you mean Garen? Uh, Garen, yeah. Garen. Okay. yeah. Garen wie Zwirn. Garen wie Zwirn, thank you. Mm. Yes, can we move to uh, Eva Fromovich, please? Sarah. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, I, I'm here. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed quite a lot of the session because I was teaching. Um, uh, but I, I heard I heard all of Michael's session, and I wanted to ask him: Could you please, could you possibly show that bookbinders tool again? I, I I couldn't see it very. You don't have a bigger picture of it. And and has anything like that been? Sorry, I'm interested in books, obviously. <laughs> Any anything like that been found elsewhere? I'm sorry to be ignorant. I just couldn't quite see it. Michael, du bist stumm geschaltet. Stumm ist okay. Um, nein, uh, it's it's only one one uh, one uh, tool we we found. I start again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's over here. Which one? Which one is it? Yeah, I just here. It's it's here. You can see it here. The one on the right. Ah. On the right, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it uh, it resembles very much a modern book binding tool called Elephant. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it is used for creasing, par creasing parchment. Mm -hmm. And um, so this, sh yeah, this tool shows, shows uh, traces of being well used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see it here, no? Yeah. And what is it made of? Um, it's bone. It's bone. It's bone. It's bone. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, fine. yeah. We also have, um, yeah, about a dozen, uh, yeah, pieces of, uh, of book clasps and um, yeah and stuff like that yeah most of them also destroyed in the pogrom of 1349 yeah, unfortunately we have no parchment in the findings no no parchment Yes. Another questions? Hey, I have a question to both of you, I guess. Um, you mentioned the uh, the bakery and then that, that you maybe can uh, locate the bakery. Are there any archaeological evidence at that at that place for the Okay. No. Sorry. I nothing. asked for Karin. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Our, our problem is that uh, the yeah that the location in the very south of the in the very north of the quarter has not been um, examined at all, and in the south uh, we are missing uh, the medieval surfaces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a question uh, for Tanya, if, if, if it's okay. Um, uh, you were mentioning uh, apothecary homes. Yeah. Um, do, we, do we know the names of the owners? And in this case, uh, are the names of the owners uh, both male and female? The reason I'm asking is because we have evidence from the Hebrew sources about uh, female Jewish healers. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Um, I, 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 yesterday I mentioned one of them, actually two of them in a lecture. Yeah. Uh, we know we know that um, the son of Asher Ben Yechiel uh, was uh, suffered some sort of eye illness, and mm -hmm. as a result, he was treated once by a female um, practitioner that was unsuccessful, and then 
by another female practitioner that was successful and managed to restore mm -hmm. his eyesight. He refers to the fact that he was blinded for almost a year and confound to his home as mm -hmm. a young child. And after uh, he was administered with a cure, um, he was healed. And I was wondering whether any traces of, uh, now healer, such healers would, you know, kind of mm -hmm. maybe corroborate with the evidence about apothecaries or people mm -hmm. who are uh, able to produce medicine of sorts. And he speaks of, of being mm -hmm. administered with medicine, not only with, pot with, with uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. magical po uh, 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 kinds of uh, amulets, but, but rather as, as being treated with, with some with materia medica. And uh, I was wondering whether maybe the uh, references in the Shrines book speak of uh, female owners of these apothecaries or maybe joint ownership as in other places in the Shrines book where we have names mm. of women. Uh, that that no. would be very tempting indeed, but I'm sorry. <laughs> no. So um, the one is not mentioned by name, but um, mm. the... Um, because uh, the yeah the Schrein's book um, mentioning um, is about its its neighboring house and it says it is the house next to the Two. Domus Apothecarii which uh -huh. is the male form of mm. um, right. of the profession and uh, the other apothecary is called Alelmus which isn't even a very Jewish name no. but uh, what we know is that he isn't the owner of the house. And it is owned by Jews, so uh -huh. if does okay. if this does help you anyhow, but I'm afraid not. Yeah. Okay, Karin has a question. Karin, I'm your uh, turn. Yes. Yes. Um, a question to to Michael. Um, I couldn't see it on the on the picture. How big is that scale? You mentioned that it was uh, could only be used for um, a weight of about three gram. Yeah. How did you calculate this? <laughs> uh, you, this you have to ask Tanya. The information to the scale comes from Tanya. I think uh, <laughs> she will ask uh, answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I think it is really, really very, very small. Maybe I think the the maybe high is there Balkenwagen. Um, is I think about six or seven centimeters only, and um, according yeah, the, the the two parts, yeah, yeah. both both sides of it, uh, the whole mm -hmm. length of it. So okay, if, if you can speak of length, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I I have uh, found this in a book where where I have found uh, yeah. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. And the other scale is much, much bigger. It's it maybe yeah. 30 yeah. centimeters. In About double, wide. double or yeah. even, yeah. even yeah. more. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Okay, Saskia has uh, another question. Hello, thank you so yes. much. It was really great and fascinating. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think I, I missed the point where you where you identified the, the goldsmith as a Jewish one. Could you repeat that? Um, the ones in the in the Shrine's book are Christian only, but uh, some of the findings are definitely from Jewish find contexts. For example, from cesspits with uh, with um, animal bones of a kosher diet. Or uh, from from the destruction debris of the pogrom of of thirteen forty nine, so we can link them to Jewish households archaeologically. Okay, and and the golden earring, of course, it would be a big question if we could link all of them together. If if that was produced by a Jew or a Christian, or if it even was produced in Cologne, we do not know. It's it's a Byzantine type. Yeah, this is we what I noticed. That yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it was it was probably produced somewhere in the Rhineland area. But um, 
when it came to Cologne, we do not know. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very, very okay. uh, careful by by pointing out where pieces like that could be produced. So it can be coming from all over Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not not from not from northern and eastern, but yeah. <laughs> so, but um, I I would be very careful to to even ask this question where it comes from because yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question to both uh, speakers. Thank you very much indeed for your wonderful presentations. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, after the prog uh, pogrom in 1349, there was a settlement later in that century, in 1372. My question is, uh, did the Jews go back to the same area in Köln? Did they? Yeah. 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 The, the, the synagogue was rebuilt and uh, uh, they b uh, bought new houses and uh, resettlement at, at the same place, yeah. Yeah. I see, so it was all rebuilt from scratch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but they had to, to, uh, yeah, to acquire the mikve and the synagogue anew because uh, it had gone to Christian owners in the meantime, yeah. Yeah, so after the pogrom, obviously the area was burned and there was no one lived there for many decades until they came back. Yeah, it was um, what, what we have, um, yeah, what we can see is uh, that, that all the real estate went to the Archbishop of Cologne and to the city because they were the owner of the Judenregal and uh, the legal owner of, the, um, of all the estates, therefore. And, um, and they had yeah, some yeah, two, um, two people selling all this, this real estate for them. This process um, was taking about yeah, more than 10 years. And um, they shared uh, yeah, the, the profits from, from it. Mm -hmm. And when, when the Jews were allowed to come, come back to Cologne um, yeah, in, two, um, in 19, uh, 1372, um, they bought back their, their real estate oh, yes. part by part, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you, there was a question, Vera, can you open now? Talk. Yeah. Vera, please. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Um, yeah, many thanks uh, for the, as always, the exciting presentation uh, of Tanya and Michael. And I have a question for both of you um, concerning the relevance of the Judengasse. Uh, references to trade or craft uh, seem to be concentrated, if not exclusively, then at least mainly along this Judengasse. This would fit with the importance of the street for the transport of goods and um, the fluctuation of visitors or customers mentioned by you, Tanya. And uh, the establishment of a one-way street could be for reasons of safety for visitors and traders or not. Mm -hmm. um, it was a bit, a bit difficult to understand you. I hope I have, I have grasped everything. Um, well, the, the one-way street might be because um, of, of safety reasons, because um, the Judengasse was not very broad street altogether, but rather narrow. So I, I can imagine that it was difficult to have two wagons or carts uh, passing each other. Um, but um, I think the um, we have... <clears throat> Yeah, the, the, the trade or craft um, wasn't only um, yeah, limited to the Judengasse, but it was also in, in the other streets as well. So definitely in, in the Budengasse in the north of, uh, of the quarter. And um, about the Engasse, we, we don't really know because um, yeah, it was difficult to um, investigate it archaeologically. And around the Schulhof, we also had um, have, have indications for, for goldsmiths. So, 
we're not limited. Yeah. Fine, is there another questions? Okay, this, uh, this time usually we are going to the coffee shops or the restaurant, <laughs> the television show near the sea, but next time I hope that uh, we will, you all will come to us. Simcha, I do have a question, I'm sorry. Yes. It well, just didn't, it didn't go fast enough, I'm sorry. Never mind. I wanted to ask whether, since the Jews had to procure their assets again, when they returned to Cologne, when they were permitted to return to Cologne, why did they go back to the very same location in town? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I, I don't know. Where okay. else did they go? That's yeah. the place to be. It's in the middle of yeah. the town. You, you want to be there. I mean, wasn't, wasn't everywhere else occupied by other people? I mean, the whole town was occupied by other people. So actually, it doesn't matter whether you stay in this or that part. And I think they, yeah, I think they wanted to 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 go back to the tradition of of using the synagogue and the mikveh. I think that was was the important part. And it was, and it was quite. And they took quite yeah a lot of hassle to to um, to buy. This, these back because both were um, uh, were parted into several parts and they had to buy them back separately and they undertook this so I think it was very important and um, yeah when they, when they left uh, um, Tanya did they go to a different city or yeah they did mm -hmm. yeah we, we know that um, some of them at least went to Frankfurt and um, maybe some to uh, to Deutz, which is uh, today part of Cologne as well, but it's on the other side, uh, yeah, of the River Rhine. But um, where they did go exactly, and all of them, we do not know. But also the Jews that were returning to Cologne in in 1372, they came from from all parts of the area as well from from Westphalia and um, and even further so a new community was uh, yeah so it's it's reborn. probably yeah. yeah yeah i don't think that there is any evidence to show that anyone from the second community is actually linked uh family wise to people from the first community I mean, I see. The, the the leader the leader of the second community is david von munschau and and he's he, he his name is David von Munchau. Mm. Uh, it's from somewhere in, else. Yeah, it's from someone else, somewhere else. And and there's no statement to the effect that he is a descendant of people who were expelled from Cologne after 1349. Yeah, and I, and I think even yeah, most of the members of the first community were murdered in the pogrom. Right. I mean, what you describe here is is a, a general situation in many many cities. Mm -hmm. Not it's only a few survived. Excuse me. May I? Yes. I know. Yes, of course. Um, uh, as uh, Tanya said already, I mean, only a few survived, and uh, they um, uh, went to other places. And uh, this second community is of the second part of the 14th century. Are generally uh, uh, constituted out of different people, out of different places. Uh, sometimes even from really other cities. Uh, I mean, Basel is a wonderful example that many people from the Elsass ended up in Basel mm -hmm. in the in, in the in, in the second half of the 14th century, or Monschau, as you are as you are describing it. But it's it, indeed, as uh, someone else asked, I, I, I forgot your, your name. Sorry, uh, is it uh, also an, an, a normal phenomena that they resettled these new founded Jewish communities at the old site? generally at the old site of the former Jewish community. But this is only changing then uh, a few generations later. Either you kick out the Jews altogether or you, or you resettle them even already in the 14th century or uh, later. I mean, in, in Rotenburg, for example, yesterday we saw a, a, a beautiful 
uh, a film about Rothenburg. So uh, the, the second community is uh, is not at the same uh, site where the first community is, mm -hmm. but uh, but in in cities like uh, Worms or Speyer or Köln or Mainz or uh, you name it. Um, there are generally also Frankfurt as well. There are uh, first of all at, at the old site, with with reasons that uh, of, of real real estate and synagogue and uh, all that. So to re to uh, to, to reestablish the Jewish community, but always in a very small size. So this is not so, it's not so a problem when uh, the, when a few Christians are succeeding in in holding their new real estates because there is plenty enough there so you so Jews and Christians living then in the same street because uh, in the empty houses or in houses where the government of the city could uh, could regain Jews can settle but not as owners but as uh, uh, someone who had rent a place and and the other houses are hold by new Christian owners yeah I think this is enough for the moment but this yeah. is not something special for Cologne this is just just the normal way as as it goes yeah but I think they even they even bought some some of the uh, of the estates as owners uh, back you mean a Jewish yeah. After, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I know a few places in Ulm for example where where you have this interesting phenomenon that the Jews do their share to, and these are other Jews, not, not these former Jews of Ulm. They know exactly which houses have been in Jewish hands before mm -hmm. uh, 1348, and they do their share to, to, to regain them. But this, yes. someone, someone should do this once. I mean, not only for one city, but for a larger scale, yes. to, so that we have an, an, a, big, a bigger picture about yeah. this. Yeah, because it was was always said that they only were able to rent the houses, but um, you can see that after um, yeah 1424 when they have to leave, um, yeah, I, that I, some I, of the houses then again were sold to Christians, mm -hmm. and there was even one Jewish family who kept their houses for another 30 years before oh. they were sold. So so they always thought they might come back. Mm -hmm. Oh, this oh this is this is also interesting. This is yeah, new. This is nice. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I also say they have only rent the houses, but of course you're right. This, this, there is everything. There is everything, mm -hmm. and and we should have. Uh, someone has to do this put together that we will have a clearer idea what mm -hmm. uh, what we will find as uh, as things in that in that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really fascinating because yes, um, I... if we're talking about new people yeah coming to the old place then mm -hmm. the symbolic stakes are very high mm. indeed i agree yeah I agree. And, um, and as i said uh, um, um, eva there there's only the number is quite quite small we have much less jews um, right. in the in the late, 20 household. Uh, 14 and also in the 15th century than we had in the first part of the 14th century mm -hmm. so everything is, is smaller it's already a, a relation to the golden age so to say before in every matter and and so yeah mm -hmm. but, but this is only true for the Rhineland. it's totally different in other places okay it's, for instance, in Erfurt, the yeah. community is much larger than the first bigger? community. Oh, this, this, this is fascinating. Michael is somewhere here. She can say this uh, much, much more detailed. She has all done, uh, done all the research. She's she, she's somewhere in 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 uh, in this in this workshop. But in Erfurt, it's the same. The, uh, the new Jews are coming to to the place, uh, uh, living in more or less the same area, and the second community is growing bigger than the first. Yeah. Well, it fits to my eastwards uh, settlement theory, but mm, but the no problem idea. is the problem is when they leave Erfurt, they go back to the west. They don't go to the east. So <laughs> don't go to the east. Okay. No, <laughs> uh, but, but but you have to ask. You has, have to ask Mike. She's somewhere here. Uh, she's yeah. knowing that much more, yeah, much the, better than me. Okay. I'm just good. I'm just quoting her. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. and also Christopher Kluze wants to say something, and Karin. As a remark, please go ahead. No, I didn't. Um, I just wanted to say that Rainer is is right, and um, that this happens all over the place, and that there's no one who has yet um, brought everything together and and weighed the evidence um, to determine why this was the case. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay. Another remarks or questions? Yes, Eva, please. I, I'm sorry, I, I know, I know, I, I also want to go to the same coffee shop on the beach, but um, <laughs> I've just remembered something that Tanya showed. I, I apologize, I came in at the end after my own class. Um, the tombstones. Mm -hmm. And uh, am I remembering correctly? Because, right, there's stonemasons, so called monumental, gravestone, tombstone masons. That's another mm -hmm. craft, right? Uh, and you were saying these are people who knew what they were doing. Is there uh, some discussion that I've missed about um, about I, to, uh, tombstone masons and carving? No, what, what I was referring to that uh, these were persons that knew how to write um, Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and no, no Christians uh, just putting it together and making many mistakes. Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, that, that would be maybe not for today, maybe for another time, that would be interesting because it connects with this question of first and second communities, mm -hmm. you know, the tombs, tomb, tombstones displaced in so many places after 1348, 49, mm -hmm. who made them, what happened to them, the fact that they got displaced and reused meant that they survived in the first place in some places, perhaps not in Cologne, but, um, oh well, is there anybody else talking about tombstones, stone, you know, stonemasons? Uh, there has been uh, a thesis about uh, the reuse of tombstones. Um, I just have forgot. Uh, yeah, I, I meant, I meant in, uh, in, 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 in this, uh, in in this conference. This workshop. Yeah. Ah. I'm just looking at the, no. sorry, it's such no. a big program. This conference, what we had a, a lecture by, by um, Stephanie Fuchs uh, two years, three years ago in Leeds, dealing with that idea, maybe also Jewish masons would work on the inscriptions at least, but it's a difficult question as, as well. Yes, another questions, remarks. Yes, uh, Sarah, can you give us more details about uh, tomorrow? Sure, tomorrow we'll begin again at 10 a.m. It'll be um, one initial, slightly longer than we have been doing session, running from 10 to 12. If Jelmi Alush is prepared to um, and has fixed his technical difficulties, he'll be doing his lecture at 12 uh, instead of the initial part of the uh, concluding session. He has not yet confirmed whether or not he'll be able to do that. We'll update people as we're able. Um, and then at the end, after the concluding session, we hope that everyone who's able will join in an online social gathering through the WonderMe uh, platform. And I'll be sending a link shortly that can be used uh, tomorrow upon the conclusion of our event. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank see you all next time in Israel.